Please come on and sit down. We're going to get going. Joining us in the piano tonight for the Star Spangled Banners, Mr. Charles Gallagher. If you all please rise. Thank you very much, Mr. Gallagher. Do we have any town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? Anyone who's just showing up? Okay, I don't see any. Ms. Rowe? Yes, Mr. Moderator, it is moved if all the business of the meeting is set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session when the meeting adjourns and adjourns to Monday, May 16th, 2011 at 8 p.m. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So, so, so moved. Um, one of our town meeting members brought his daughter to see around. She was wondering where daddy goes every Monday and Wednesday, so I'm going to say hi to her because she was about five. Hi, Megan. I told her I would. Any other announcements or resolutions? Any announcements or resolutions? Good. None. Any reports or committees to be submitted this evening? None. Oh, wow. We're moving right along. Uh, so we don't need Article 23. That brings us back to Article 21. Mr. Tosti was next on the list. Mr. Gordon, uh, I got him. Mr. Moderator, fellow town meeting members, I would like to move to amend the proposed vote under Article 21 by replacing in the last line the word last before Friday with third shall not be open, or shall open not later than the first week of December, nor shall it be closed earlier than the third Friday of the following January. Second. That's been seconded. Do you have it in writing, or you gave it to me? Can I give it to you? Okay. 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 Give it to me. That's within the minor change. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I think the, uh, the Board of Selectmen have usually handled this reasonably well over the years. I'm not quite sure why we need this article, but if we do have this article, I'd really urge that you not keep the warrant open until the last Friday of January. Um, and, and the first week in December, I don't really care, but it's sort of irrelevant because like 90%, and I think the Selectmen's office can reinforce this, probably 90% of all the articles that come in to the warrant come in in the last day or two. Uh, so it doesn't matter how early you open it, they're all going to come in in the last couple of days. Um, once the warrants all come into the Board of Selectmen, they all get reviewed by the, uh, by the Town Council. Board of Selectmen office then starts putting them together into a warrant. That whole process takes several weeks. Uh, it might seem simple to you, but it's not. It takes a while to pull that together. 
Meanwhile, the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee and even the Re Redevelopment Board are waiting for these things to all get fit into a form so they could start their hearings. Now, what the Finance Committee is usually doing is in uh, last week of January, really pretty much throughout February, we're meeting with department heads, going with the manager, being with the school department, and trying to analyze all of the different budgets because we take care of those in March. So what we're trying to do is fill up February with all the hearings on the Warren articles. And it's probably even a tougher job for the selectmen than for us, but hearing these Warren articles and then trying to come up with a solution is usually not a let's just vote on it type of thing. People have got to be discussed, other people have got to be consulted, uh, other committees and stuff to try to come up with a, 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 an article which makes sense, which everybody's behind, so we don't fight all these things out before town meeting. Finance committee's got to do the same thing to a somewhat lesser degree, but uh, so all this whole process takes a great deal of time, uh, including just scheduling and getting people to come in. Uh, if, if, and so we, the, the selectmen, get their warrant out, their, their reports to you on the redevelopment list. board. They mail them, so you have them at least a week before town meeting starts. The fi finance committee works very hard to have them on your seats. The first night of town meetings, so you have a couple of weeks to review them before it gets into the, uh, uh, into the actual budgets. If you want to have that continue to happen, you can't squeeze us on the other side. A week might not seem like a great deal, but I, I, it is a great deal, you know, because we're being squeezed in April to get all of this done. So again, uh, I'd urge you to vote for the amendment, making it simply the third Friday of January as opposed to the last Friday of January. People have got, as it is, six weeks, seven weeks to get their warrant articles in. Uh, they don't need an eighth week. Um, so again, uh, I'd ask you to vote uh, for my amendment, making it the third Friday instead of the last Friday. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, Ms. Rowe, you were next on the list. Yep, I'm keeping the list from last week. The rest of the precinct six, I just want to echo what um, Al Tosti said. We had to um, have public hearings for 40 warrant articles in five nights. We can do that, but um, I don't want to repeat everything he said, but it's terribly hard on the staff. It's not, it's not so much the selectmen, it's the, our staff that suffer. So I, I ask you to please consider what Mr. Tosti said. Thank you. Mr. Maher. Uh, John Maher, Precinct uh, 14. I'll be brief. Um, I think the, the, the motion of the uh, the Town Meeting Procedures Committee is as ill-advised as it is well-intentioned. Uh, to me, this is a, a solution in search of a problem. The, uh, the, the warrant is open now for upwards of six to seven weeks. As Mr. Tosti has indicated, Ms. Rowe has indicated, the warrant articles come in, no matter when you open it and when you close it, they come in at the very last week. And to further constrain the ability of the selectmen, the board of uh, the uh, finance committee and the redevelopment board who has statutory uh, time periods they have to comply with uh, if zoning articles come in under chapter 40A, to the extent that you try to constrain that, you're really not, uh, it's not gonna be productive. Even now the selectmen come up and ask for postponements because they simply have not had an opportunity to hear all the arguments pro and con on, on various articles. It sounds like a long time that they have, but they have to, people, 20, uh, 10 registered voters, they have to schedule people to come in, they could discuss it, discuss it, they need more information from department heads and so forth, and it really, really uh, takes a long time. And to the extent that you try, again, to sandwich, get it further out, and now it has surface appeal. Oh, it's our warrant, we want to keep it open, uh, townspeople, uh, that's not really a realistic viewpoint at all. I, I guess I'm going to support Mr. Tosti's motion, uh, sub, uh, the uh, amended motion, but the original motion of the Town Meeting Procedures Committees, uh, do, do they really mean to have it in the first week of December and the last 
Friday in January, that could be as many as eight weeks. Why do you need to have the warrant open for eight weeks? Six or seven weeks is plenty. Uh, by the way, in some instances, and I, and I sat where Ms. Rice sits now, and she reviews, as I did, the warrant articles for uh, many years, and I, I can count on one hand the time that people have come up to me and said, you know, the warrant closed too early, I wanted to put articles in. Doesn't happen. And even if it does, in those few occasions when it does happen, the, uh, the selectmen under Chapter 39, as Ms. Rice will agree, I know, because I just spoke to her about it, Section 10 recites that the warrant is drawn under the hands of the selectmen, meaning they can put in warrant articles in right up to the day that it goes to the print. And I think any, by the way, it's been suggested by some members of the uh, Town Meeting Procedure Committees, they don't like that to happen. The selectmen have too much authority. Well, folks, it's the general laws. So in those particular occasions where someone missed it and it's important enough, the selectmen can still insert it. The attempt by the Town Meeting Procedures Committee to squeeze the time between when the warrant closes and when uh, the town meeting is, 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 you know, it's well intentioned, no question about that, but it's very ill advised. And I would urge you to defeat that. And if you're inclined to put any uh, constraints here, then support uh, Mr. Tosti's motion. Thanks very much. Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, longtime town meeting member. Um, I seem to think that there are a bunch of red herrings swimming around here now, and no amount of herring aids will, will help this one. If you look at the warrant, go look at the 76 articles in the regular warrant and the seven articles in the special, only nine were submitted as 10 registered voter articles. And that's all we are talking about is the right of citizens to submit 10 registered voter articles. As the distinguished former town council just said, the selectmen can continue to insert past the, quote, closing of the warrant up until the time they send it to the printer. It is their right under the law. I also agree with Mr. Maher. It is the law. It's a selectman's responsibility, and I wouldn't want to address that. I think that that's the way the government was designed to work, and it should go that way. But what we're saying to the citizens is that we're going to hold a meeting at the end of April, and if you want to get something on the agenda, you'd better get it in by the sometime in January, second week, third week, first week, sometimes when we push it, and if it's a special, you've got to get it in between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Uh, it tends to be a roadblock to citizen participation, and it is a needless roadblock. Uh, I would also like to point out to this meeting sort of a continuing saga if you are a reader of the Arlington List and have been since 2006, you would see a regular dance that occurs around February when the first selectman's agenda shows up announcing warrant article hearings. In 2008, there was indeed a warrant article submitted identical to this one from the same group. It was announced as a warrant article hearing for the first meeting in February before any draft of the warrant was made available to the general public. This is a continuing problem. I would hope that this committee who's making procedural recommendations on behalf of the meeting, and I would hope the selectmen who are listening will do something to ensure that the legislature of this town knows what the content of this hearing is before we start to schedule hearings. I remind you of the public records and open meeting laws which state that any time they put something in print and send it to the selectmen, it is a public document. The selectmen have the draft 
of the warrant in their hands. One of the members of the selectmen has been kind enough to type in the text of the uh, proposed articles that has not been made available to us. I think it is essential, and I hope the uh, town meeting uh, procedures committee insists upon it, that as soon as the articles are in print and delivered to the selectmen, that they may be made available in electronic format so that we can monitor them and monitor the hearings as well. Because it is inexcusable for every year since 2006 to go through the same thing where Peter Fuller has his annual question, you've got these warrant articles up for hearings and nobody knows what they are. We deserve to know that and I hope that as soon as it's closed, as soon as it's typed up, as soon as it's in print, as soon as it's a public document, it be made available to us electronically and not kept back for whatever reason it's kept back. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Loretti. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I rise in support of Mr. O'Connor's substitute motion and against Mr. Tosti's amendment. I would like to ask if anyone can recount all the problems that was had when they weren't closed in the year 2007. Can anyone remember all the problems? I didn't think so. It closed on the, on the last Friday of January. Um, and I say that because, as Mr. Slickman just said, there's a lot of red herrings going around here. One of them was that we need to protect the redevelopment board. I can tell you as the chair of the redevelopment board this year, the redevelopment board was completely taken aback by the early closing of the warrant. We had no idea it was going to close so early, and it caused a lot of problems for the redevelopment board because the selectmen did not notify the board when it was going to be closed or that it would be closed that early. It's actually very rare, pretty rare for citizens to submit warrant articles for zoning changes. And, and frankly, if they're submitted the last day of January, I don't believe that causes any problems whatsoever for the Redevelopment Board. What does cause problems is when town officials submit them well after the end of January. And that's, that's the real problem, but that does not apply in this case. I don't see any problems whatsoever. Let me just read for you some of the closing dates for recent years. 2010, January 22nd. Um, 2008, January 23rd. Another week, another eight days is not going to make any difference. I urge you to support the original substitute motion of Mr. O'Connor and reject the amendment of Mr. Tosti. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. LaCourt. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15, although I'm speaking as a selectman at the moment. Um, I voted against this article, and that is I voted no action for it when it first came before us um, this year, and I voted for it, I voted no action against it when it was before us a few years ago for one very simple reason, and that is because I believe that what we are trying to do here is enshrine a policy and a bylaw. That is what should be a Board of Selectmen's policy about when the warrant opens and closes. Yes, and Mr. Warden is very amused because he's right. This year, we uh, closed the warrant sooner than our stated policy um, um, requires, and he had to remind us, and we had to reopen it. And hence, this article has been re-raised. Um, I don't have trouble with the restrictions in the article. I do support Mr. Tosti's um, uh, amendment because I think that's more reasonable for my staff. But since people have raised this set of issues, I'd like to tease out a couple of things here. So the first thing is that we're balancing three sets of things here. One is making sure citizens have access to insert articles in the warrant. Another is making sure the selectman's office has enough time to do all the things they have to do to prepare the warrant, have the warrant looked at by the various people who look at it, redraft it if necessary, um, organize us for hearings, for us to hold the hearings, for the votes to get into the warrant and the warrant to get to the printer. So there is a big process crunch for them. And then there's the issue of when can we start holding the hearings so that we can further that process crunch along. 
And Mr. Schlickman is suggesting that we can't start the hearings until we have a draft warrant ready to go. And the problem with that is that the draft warrant doesn't come out until several weeks, at least several weeks, after we close the warrant. And the reason that we don't issue it as a public document at that point is that until certain sets of eyes have gone over it, and the moderator and Mr. Tosti and Mr. Sullivan have all agreed about the order of the articles, we may be publishing a draft where literally the number on the article is going to change. So that I think that that would be very confusing, particularly for those of you who are used to referring to articles by their number. If sometime between a draft that came out the first week in February and a draft that came out the second week and a draft that came out at the end, the warrant numbers were changing because the order in which we were planning to present the articles changed. So we're trying to balance all of these competing interests. Okay? So if you don't trust us, to do what we said we would do, and I must apologize because I'm usually the niggle about this because I think the warrant should be open for a while, then I suppose you might enshrine this in a bylaw rather than leaving it as a selectman's policy, but I personally think that's just as a precedent a bad idea. However, I would um, suggest then that you vote for Mr. Tosti's um, amendment because there's plenty of time over that period of time. In practical fact, the only reason we leave the warrant open that long is because we all know there's this dead zone in the middle there that is the last two weeks in December and the first week in January when everybody is busy with family and holidays and is not running around getting their 10 signatures on warrant articles. And we need to leave the warrant hour, hour open a few weeks after that in order to allow the citizens who suddenly go, oh, there's a thing I want to do and I need to do a warrant article, and how do I go about this, and how do I get it to Juliana, and all that stuff, so that they have a little time to process that, even if we're already deep into January, okay? But make no mistake, my staff needs a couple of weeks before they can put a draft out for you, and if you want the rule to be that we don't hold hearings until you have a draft in your hands, so you know what articles we're discussing, then it's really critical that we close that warrant, either the second or third Friday in January, so that we have the time to get that draft to you before we start our warrant article hearings. I suppose it would be possible for us to hold the warrant open longer, but begin the hearings, but then you won't have a draft of the articles. Okay? And in fact, I'm informed by my town council, I was amazed to discover this, that we're not actually technically required by law to hold hearings on the selectmen's articles. So, but we do try to hold a hearing on every article, including the citizens' articles and the selectmen's articles and so on and so forth. And sometimes we even hold hearings on articles that aren't ours just because we have opinions. Um, so I hope we can um, have some balance here on this article. And I do urge you to consider seriously whether you want to enshrine a policy and a bylaw because I've worked very hard over the course of my six years as a selectman to see that we don't do that with many articles that come before us where we can solve the problem by just doing what's being asked of us rather than creating a whole bylaw that will tie our hands. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaCourt. Um, Mr. Healy? Uh, Mr. Warden? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, John Warden, Precinct 8. Um, and a member of the town meeting uh, procedures committee. Um, <clears throat> okay, I just want to make a few uh, points here in, in support of the uh, committee's recommendation to you. Um, back in the uh, in the old days, uh, when say Mr. Greeley's father was on the board of selectmen, <clears throat> um, uh, the, um, the 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 warrant was closed uh, around the end of January. Elections were held on the first Saturday of March. Town meeting began on the second Monday of March. Um, so you had about a, maybe a six week uh, uh, interval between the closing of the warrant and the opening of town meeting. Now somehow everything got done and the Finance Committee got its act together and the uh, Redevelopment Board and the, uh, and the Selectmen. And, uh, uh, but then uh, it was decided that to avoid having to vote in the snow, we would move the election from the first Saturday of March to the first Saturday of April. There's a gentleman in the hall that spark plugged that. Uh, and look, look what happened this year. We had snow. 
Uh, so it doesn't always work. But the, the, the point of it is that suddenly another six weeks was added on to the uh, period between the closing of the warrant and the beginning of the town meeting. And now we've heard that, uh, well, they really need all these weeks to do all their things, and certainly we don't want to overburden anyone. But I, I, I just point out that um, <clears throat> uh, it wasn't always thus, and somehow the town survived for uh, really uh, centuries uh, without having this, this great uh, gap uh, between. And, and we're not trying to, the, the article before you uh, uh, is, is not trying to change that really. I mean one week, I can't see that one week would make much difference one way or the other. If, if, if subtracting a week will bring the, the uh, affection of Mr. Tosti and his allies uh, to the cause of this article, then fine. Um, but, and, and as far as not having hearings till the war, uh, our, uh, warrant is in final form, I think, that's, uh, I think that's unnecessary. I think you can deal with that. Um, I, I'd just like to point out that uh, wh when we brought this uh, before the, uh, uh, before the uh, uh, selectmen and, and the town meeting uh, back in, uh, I think it was, uh, was it 2008, uh, um, I, I did a little survey on the moderators. The moderators have a thing we call the gavel line where we ask each other questions and get advice and so on. And uh, uh, of those that responded, uh, Arlington had the second longest window between the closing of the warrant and the beginning of the meeting of any other community. Uh, Stoughton has very, a lot of very odd and convoluted rules and they, um, uh, they had a longer period than, than we did. Um, now, of course, even though citizens are, and, and other boards, I mean, you say there's only nine articles submitted by 10 registered voters, but there are also articles submitted by other boards, committees, and so on, such as the Town Government Reorganization Committee, the Redevelopment Board, and, uh, maybe Vision 2020 or, or something like that. So, so it's not just the citizens' articles which are put in kind of a straitjacket when you try to uh, uh, shut it off early. Um, the <clears throat> but the selectmen, of course, ha have the right, as, as uh, mentioned by Mr. Marr, to, to um, uh, insert articles uh, whenever they want or up until it goes to the printer. Um, and, and they say, well, you can, if, if, you know, if you have a real problem, you go to the selectmen, they'll put it in for you. Well, they may or they may not. I think it maybe depends on who you are. Um, but <clears throat> and, 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 but it, back in, in, in 08 or 07, whenever it was, we, uh, the town meeting government, town meeting procedures committee, uh, withdrew or, or, or assented to a no action, didn't press the thing, uh, uh, because the selectmen adopted a policy. And uh, it said they will um, uh, be open not later than the first week of December, nor closed earlier than the end of the third, week, uh, week of, third full week of January. The board will not depart from this policy without prior consultation with the town meeting procedures committee. Well, this, uh, this uh, year in the sort of the run up to the Christmas season, I read the uh, advocate and I said, the warrant has been opened and will close on January 7th. And I thought, wait a minute. And I looked back in the old records and dug up the policy and sent an email to the chairman of the board of selectmen and, and said, you know, what's going on here? Uh, I thought we had agreed that it would, the warrant wouldn't close until the end of the third week. And I didn't get a response, but the next thing I heard was that they were scheduling a special meeting on a Thursday afternoon at 3 o'clock or some strange time that no one's ever met before. And, and they had a very quick meeting and they decided uh, to, uh, oh, that was a mistake. We'll, we'll make it the January 23rd or, or, or some date more in accordance with the policy. And, uh, well, th that's, uh, th that's good. And then we asked her, well, you know, what happened? And they said, well, we forgot. So th that's why we thought it, it, it was important that policies, I guess, can be forgotten. And who, who in this hall has not forgotten something one time or another? Uh, <coughs> um, maybe your wife's anniversary or your birthday or something like that. I'll get you in real trouble. Um, uh, but um, the, 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 the point is, with the policy, you won't always, and I'm sure they'll be glad of it, they won't always have John Borden to send them an email and say, what happened to the policy? So we thought it was in, in, in important uh, and worthwhile that it be enshrined in the bylaw 
and then uh, presumably they won't forget the bylaws, and, and we'll know, and everybody will know there'll be a constant uh, date that anybody can look at. It's going to be the same this year, next year, 10 years from now. We'll know when the warrant will open, we'll know when the warrant will close, and everybody will have a shot to get their articles in. So I appreciate your, uh, ask for your support on the, uh, the committee's uh, recommendation under Article 21. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, Mr. McCorry. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Hugh McCrory, Precinct 20. Um, I'll be brief. I'll try not to repeat what's already been said. Uh, the purpose and intent of this article is basically to provide residents more time to file, uh, file uh, articles uh, to the selectmen. Um, I should also disclose that I'm also on the uh, Time Pre uh, Procedures Committee. Um, with respect to the selectmen, uh, we, we, when we were deliberating this, we were we, we essentially, to, to quote a, a verb, that's, we, we trust the selectmen. We, we do. We trust the selectmen. When we were deliberating on this, you know, we're, we're not trying to put more pressure on the selectmen. We're just trying to leave the, they give good guidance to the, the residents of Arlington of when, when the, when the, um, when the war, article period should be opened. Uh, basically, uh, to, to Mr. Tosti's point, and I mean, I respect Mr. Tosti, um, if we were to close uh, the warrant uh, article period uh, on the third Friday, if the 1st of January was, uh, was a Friday, that means we'd be closing the article on, a fifth, on the 15th of January, since the 1st is a Friday, uh, the 8th is a Friday, the 15th, in theory, we'd be closing it. That's a bit early. Uh, we've, uh, people have referenced holidays uh, of, from different, uh, of different categories. People are busy. Families are busy. January uh, is a good time for residents to, to get those uh, signatures and submit. Also, uh, this, time, this time meeting has already uh, required department heads to have submitted their budgets by, I think, the second day of, of January. So, you know, th that should also keep things running, running smoothly and should help the selectmen. Uh, I guess you have to ask yourself, wh why was this article brought up? And it's not to uh, add more pressure to the selectmen, it's really to give the residents a little bit of time in January to submit their 10 registered uh, voter articles. Um, so I ask you to, uh, to support the amendment uh, proposed by Mr. O'Connor. I ask you not to support the amendment uh, support, uh, proposed by Mr. Tosti. Uh, with respect to the selectman and, the, and the, uh, the proponent of that. So please support uh, Mr. O'Connor's uh, amendment. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. McCoy. Mr. Hayner? <clears throat> Bill Hayner, Precinct 2. Mr. Moderator, uh, going on with uh, just what the last speaker said, uh, you initially accepted... Uh, Mr. Toski's amendment, based that it did not substantially change it, but no, what? The, it, not that it substantially changed it; that it was a simple change. Okay, a simple, simple change. Simple change. It's so the the actual. It, do you accept the the fact that it could substantially change the the effect of this? It would, yeah. Thank but you. But it, it's a simple change. Okay, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I wanted that clarified. Uh, another question. Uh, when an article is submitted, does it go directly to council, or do all the articles have to be submitted before they go to council? The articles are submitted to the selectman's office, and what Ms. Rice is available for is to help someone draft an article so that it's proper and that we would actually have something to vote on. So once, just for my own understanding, once an article is submitted, the procedure can start right away if it's submitted uh, as the warrant is open, am I correct? You'd have to ask Ms. Kropelka and Ms. Rowe how the, what the internal procedures then are. Then I would selected. ask that through the chair. Yeah. So the, and then the, pro, the basic process that has been outlined by self, several people starts right away. So the hearings could, can the hearings start once that process, is gone? the warrant has to close before the hearings. Ms. But, Rowe or Ms. Kropelka, would you like to address Mr. Hainer's questions? These are things I don't know. Um, no, the, the warrant hearings can't 
begin until the warrant's closed. Okay, so the sent to you legal, uh, the drafting of it, the legal part of it, all that part can be done as the uh, different articles come in. Yes. So what would be left for those articles would be the actual hearing. Right, it's not so much the hearing part of it. It's um, the time consuming part is, number one, not everybody goes to the town council first before they submit their warrant article. I understand, I understand that. Okay. okay. But so it's where I'm coming from of... is that, based on a, another <coughs> previous speaker, that a, a minority of these articles are coming from the uh, 10 registered voters. That if we can get the town side, and granted they're not all going to be coming in that first week, but if, if part of the different departments <laughs> can be get them in earlier, this may alleviate part of this problem. I'm in support of, uh, of the maximum amount of time for the 10 registered voters, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, sir. And it's, um, we, the, the town departments are just like everybody else. They wait until the last minute as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, they do. They do. Oh, good call. thing the clock's still running. Excuse me, but correct me if I'm wrong. Don't the town departments work for you folks? Yes, but they're thank human you. beings. Thank you. That's, that should not be the 10 taxpayers and the regular people's problem. That belongs to the town. Thank you. Mr. Jameson. Yeah. Kevin. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. Uh, first off, I hope Mr. Warden is always here to correct the selectmen should they err in their ways. Um, tribute to the selectmen in that they do most of the time bend over backwards to address constituents' concerns. Um, but I, I, want, I want to just look at the flip side of what Mr. Schlickman talked about. Yes, there's only nine or ten registered voter articles. There's nine or ten from committees. Thirty of the articles are the selectmen and the managers. So my question is uh, addressing the issue that came up when Mr. Hainer was up here, which was, uh, why do we have to wait on those articles until the warrants is closed? Can someone explain that to me? Ms. Rice, I mean, I mean, 50, do you understand 50 of the articles question? out of these 76 are either finance articles, many of which asking? are placeholders that happen every year, and they're from the selectmen and the town manager. Why can't those hearings begin once the warrant is open? Can someone explain that to me? Can you have, do you, I think his question is, can you have hearings as the warrant articles roll in? Thank is you. that correct, essentially, it, Mr. Jamison? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town Council. I think that would be exceedingly inefficient. Frequently, articles come in from uh, various places that deal with the same subject. Articles um, may not be final until the warrant is closed, and I can sort of only be in one place at once. And if I'm helping people to write articles, I can't really, at the very same time, prepare the selectmen's materials for the hearing. So I do the best I can. I start writing articles at the beginning of December, and um, I pretty much don't stop with warrant-related activities until June. So. You could, but I think you'd end up repeating a lot of the hearings and having to call the same people back. And one thing that we try to do once we have all the articles in one place is to organize the hearings so one department head doesn't have to attend every selectman's meeting for a month. Um, so maybe you could. I don't think it'd be very practical. I think we'd miss a lot. So, um, you know, I, I get upset sometimes when people fail to think out of the box, and this is, this is, this is a moment when I'm a bit perturbed by that. You know, uh, lots of people are familiar, if they, I, I don't have children, but lots of my friends have children who have applied to college. Many colleges have something called rolling admissions. I don't, and, and I understand that some people like to have a certain number next to their article and everyone gets perturbed about that. But I know the Finance Committee looks at a draft warrant that doesn't have right the same numbers. So I don't understand why, um, you know, with all due respect to Ms. Kropelka and her staff, who I admire um, immensely, why the, the main bodies can't get these regular articles taken care of. And may, maybe the Finance Committee can vote, you know, the, some of these placeholder things. They just have to fit in a number. 
But wh why, why this can't happen and then we can't have Mr. O'Connor's uh, thing pass? So I'm, I'm in support of Mr. O'Connor's motion. And I, I think that the, that the most vast, huge majority of the articles come from people other than the town's folks. So that the, that the town manager has asked for the budget to be done early. We can begin uh, reviewing articles the moment the uh, warrant begins. I see no, no hindrance to do that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Tully? Joe Tully, Precinct 14. Can someone just clarify for me, uh, the selectmen have a policy that's reflected in our blue selectmen's report. M Mr. Tosti's um, amendment would make that window uh, shorter, smaller, earlier, correct? There, Al, you want, you want to speak to this? No. <laughs> Their policy closes it, I believe, the last fri the Friday of the last, of the third full week. The third full week, and Mr. Tosti's amendment week. is the third Friday, which potentially could come before the end of the third full week, correct? Correct. Okay. In the scenario Mr. McCory pointed out, yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. O'Connor, a second time? James O'Connor, Precinct 19. Um, I rise again as part of the Town Meeting Procedures Committee because our charter, when you all voted in 2007, was to make town meeting more attractive. How do we have it more attractive? Because we feel useful. If we come before this body, we sit here, and all the boards have already made all the decisions we're nothing but what they used to call a Stamp Act Congress. I rose before you several times last year and said we're asking to adopt resolutions which have recommendations that we haven't really fully debated. Our charge from the people when they vote for us and in the gavel which I've been reading as your assistant moderator, I also read all these other towns of issues that come up and they really address how people want to be heard. We need to keep the warrant open. You've heard Mr. Loretti, Mr. Worden, Mr. <clears throat> Schlickman, and other people speak to the past history. The main problem here is we don't have anything in writing, and I hate to say this, but I went to the town clerk's office and I asked for the selectman's procedure manual. There is no procedure manual. Unfortunately, the procedures get done each and every year as they go along as a course of business. I think Ms. Kropelka is a wonderful administrator. I would never fault her, but she can't be Mr. Worden and all of us together, now can she? The second thing is that I want to tell you, in putting up the minutes for the Town Meeting Procedures Committee, I had the opportunity to talk to Joan Roman. Joan Roman is one of our town employees that works on the website. It's really easy to work with. It's very easy to get things done. And all we have to do is use the technology before us, the internet, Microsoft Word. We're not using punch cards anymore. We're being asked, you know, to, as boards, to give to the manager copies of reports, copies of budgets that are balanced beforehand. I happen to know that back in 2008, the Board of Selectmen met and discussed an article that any LaCourt recommended for all of us to consider in that subsequent year, and that was the technology developments for the town. Because the Board looks at these issues all year long, we're not in a vacuum of just saying January. December, we talk about the warrant. We should be looking at it all year. If there's an article that somebody didn't prevail upon this year, we have the right to change that. We have a way to recall. But we're more learned about the procedures because we sit here and get copies of the finance report. We get copies of the selectmen's report. Not everybody in the town gets one. 
And I got to tell you, Arlington's very fortunate because one of the towns raised Cain because their board of selectmen decided to save money and said, we're not going to send selectmen's reports or FinCom reports or any other reports to anybody in the town anymore for an open town meeting because it costs too much money. And that's unfortunate. But we're here in Arlington. We have a wonderful supply of resources. We have an incredible array of volunteers. And I think we owe it to the taxpayers to let them have an open warrant for as long as feasibly possible. It seems it's worked before, and as Mr. Warden, who has many more years than I have standing before you, said it used to work when there was only six weeks for a warrant to be processed. Why can't it be done now? So please vote for my motion to keep the warrant open to the last Friday in January. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Marquis. Ken Marquis, Precinct 9. I'm wondering what specifically we are doing by amending the bylaws. And I'm an extremely intelligent person, but I'm not a lawyer. And I think that explanations should be offered when we are asked to amend the bylaws so that people understand more what we are trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Deist. John Deist, Precinct 13. Uh, I, I speak to you in the context of having been on the Finance Committee for, I guess it's more than 20 years now, and realizing that the process by which the Finance Committee does what it does has gotten more and more complex as we've had more and more difficulties with the budget. Uh, the, the hearings and our own meetings with department heads begin to crowd our time rather severely. Ellen spoke about it, but if you truly want us to try to do the job that I think we can do very well, which is to try hard in the budget to balance the priorities uh, against the money that's available, then we really do have to have the time to be able to deliberate about the budgets. And that, if, if that time is to be there, that means that in addition to that time, we have to have the time for the hearings. And I can simply tell you that it gets rather hectic toward the end of our process, especially for us to put out to you the, what I think is a quality finance committee report. It really is very, very difficult for us to do the job in the time available to us. Uh, it isn't just hearings, it's hearings, it's deliberation to try to figure out how to balance the budget in the face of the prior in, in the context of the priorities and as well meeting many many times with uh, uh, with the the various directors of uh, uh, of divisions of, of the town in order to be able to try to understand what it is that we might or might not want to do in order to try to uh, achieve the priority so if you want the quality report that you've seen in the past from the Finance Committee, maybe I'm pretentious to think that it's a quality report, but I think it is, uh, then quite frankly, uh, I, I strongly urge you to uh, vote for uh, uh, Alan Tosti's amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Mr. West. Paul, you had your hand up? No, okay. Mr. McKinney. Eric Berger. Lawrence McKinney, 7th Precinct, land of horrible sidewalks. Um, first, um, I'm, I have not seen this even brought up, and perhaps that's far outside the box to think of this, but as William of Ockham once spoke, uh, the simplest answer to a question is sometimes the best. It's a 
apparent here that everyone seems to be rushing to get things through the door before it comes down. As one of those people with the, getting the 10, and therefore probably being 10% of that entire problem, um, I sort of wonder why we just don't open the warrant as soon as the town meeting is over. We can close it anytime we want to. And that's when things have to start, but you know, give them a whole lot of time if they want. That's one reason I think we should probably think about doing that. The second part is that this is sort of a niggling thing. We don't have the time. I want my staff to have more time. This is the town of Arlington, for goodness sake. We can find some part-time people from a job assistant bureau for that kind of work if we, if we seriously need it. Of course, if they could go sooner, we could all work a little faster. And it would be helpful if they were always there. I was making a bad joke the other day that Mr. President's first name should be Mr. Greeley not, because every time we see things, Mr. Greeley's not present. I don't see him here either. Scope. Okay, well, if we are to believe that the people are having difficulty finishing the work on time, perhaps if a uh, roll call were held and they didn't do it until they were all there, they could do it that much faster. Second, thirdly, having, having uh, received one tongue lashing from uh, uh, Mr. Tosti, whom I respect amazingly for getting an amendment in late, and a few more later on, I don't think that we would have a town meeting if Mr. Tosti didn't get an opportunity to tongue lash a few people once a year. And if we keep it the way it is, Mr. McKinney, we will Mr. McKinney, yes? keep, keep your remarks not ad hominem. All right. You're getting no very close to the okay, point where I get mad. I'm speaking as a sidewalk. Um, <laughs> at any rate, I would, uh, I, I would have you support Mr. Connors and uh, go with the uh, committee and give us the time that we need to do as much as we can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Lavalli. Brian LaValle, Precinct 15, motion to terminate debate on all matters under this article. Thank you. Motion to terminate debate on all matters for the article. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Debate is terminated. We have... I terminated debate. You lose. <laughs> we have before us the um, recommended vote of the town meeting procedure committee by Mr. O'Connor and the amendment by Mr. Tosti changing the last Friday to the third Friday. First, we're going to vote on Mr. Tosti's amendment. All in favor of Mr. Tosti's amendment, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. My opinion is defeated. We have now before us a recommended vote of the... Sir. Yeah, I see three people arising, so... Oh, yeah, well, yeah, come on, guys. All righty. Everybody opposed to Mr. Tosti's amendment. Everybody for Mr. Tosti's amendment, please rise. All in favor of Mr. Tosti's amendment. Eight, Mr. Mr. Slickman has eight. That's on the left. Up front, eight. eight. Mr. O'Connor, 16. sixteen. Mr. Trembley, thirteen. thirteen. Mr. Uh, McCabe, 16. sixteen. All opposed to Mr. Tosti's amendment, please rise. Sir? Zero. Zero up front. <laughs> Mr. Schlickman? 30. 30. Mr. O'Connor? 24. 24. Mr. Trembley? 29. Mr. McCabe? 27. 27. The vote is in the negative, 110 in the negative, 61 in the positive. The motion is defeated. We have now before us the recommended, excuse me, the substitute motion of the town meeting procedure committee's 
by Mr. O'Connor. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. My opinion is an affirmative vote. That brings us back to article. Yes, sir. The motion has substituted. It didn't get sub. Oh, we have to do it again? Oh, my goodness. Well, they didn't have a motion. The selectmen did not have a motion or a recommended vote. Thank you, sir. That brings us back to 17, which was on. The second night, the 27th, they put a postponement on, and I understand Mr. Sayre wants to talk. Mr. Kerr. Kerr. Oh, thank you. Mike Kerr, Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, we're back to, Arlington, uh, to Article 17, the temporary seasonal signs at athletic fields. Um, we're back after having worked with uh, town council, the original proponent, the planning director, and the moderator. Uh, with a substitute article uh, that has been unanimously approved by the Redevelopment Board. Um, there is one small change to the uh, our substitute article that was left on your chairs, realized after the fact that I'm a real bad typist, and missed one change that was in the ARB vote uh, that did not make it into the vote of, uh, that's on your chairs. I just want to point it out, to, it's the one that you'll see up here. And what it is, is um, the difference is simply that instead of saying uh, at a fenced athletic field with a permanent structure to seat more than 300 persons, uh, it should have said with one or more permanent structures to seat more than 300 persons. And that flows in two different places within the vote itself. And then um, there's one place that's affected within the uh, red line that is shown in your vote. So I apologize for any confusion that that might make. Um, my typing could certainly be better. Um, the, this article um, looks a lot different than the one that was presented earlier. But with town council's help and, and all the different uh, folks that I mentioned, it accomplishes what we believe uh, the original intent was. And uh, it's, a, it's a good article uh, and a good, will make for a good bylaw. Uh, the, the article would allow for temporary seasonal signs at fenced athletic fields with a se seating capacity of more than 300. The season that we're talking about would be between March 15th and December 15th. And any signs uh, would have to be part of a plan that would be subject to the special permit process of the ARB, including the public hearings uh, associated with the plan. The notion is, is that the plan itself would be part of the special permit, and then the signs would be, have to be uh, put up in accordance with that plan. Uh, the article uh, would accommodate signs at, uh, at the Pierce Field at Arlington High School in order to raise funds for the schools. Um, it's, that's really all I've got to say about the article. I would ask Mr. Moderator, um, if uh, we, we would like Mr. Uh, Stephen Harrington, the original proponent of the article, to speak to the substitute motion, and then after that, I'd be happy to answer any additional questions that folks might have. Okay, Mr. Harrington's a town resident. He can come forward. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen Harrington, 45-year town resident. The I'm the original proponent of this article. Actually. Uh, came from the Arlington Athletic Advisory Committee. It was interesting to listen to the discussion about the um, citizen initiative warrant articles that preceded this. Uh, since this is a citizen initiative warrant article, we started on December 16th when we were impaneled, and we knew we wanted to raise funds uh, to support athletics at the Arlington High School. And when we did that, um, we thought, uh, we looked through what had been done in the past and we saw that these types of warrant articles to do advertising had been before you in the past and so we thought this was a good way to raise funds for the schools. And so what we did is we actually submitted an article um, to our group, then we talked to the chair of the redevelopment board and that took about a week and then we talked to town council 
and had her approve the original language, and that took about a week. And then we went out and got signatures, and uh, we got 72 signatures in one weekend. So uh, there was widespread support in the community immediately to do this. Um, if we had had the uh, warrant um, open for a couple weeks, we probably could have gotten 700 uh, signatures. Everyone we've talked to has really supported this article, and I, I think that um, uh, I don't have a lot to add other than to say that if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Um, this intent of this article is to have advertising for the spectators and the participants on the playing fields at Arlington High School and nowhere else. So um, we're looking to have uh, people who are coming to sporting events at the playing fields behind the high school uh, see these um, sponsorship signs. And if you, um, uh, what we're really looking to do is have a very tasteful set of sponsorship signs that mostly display the logo of the high school, the colors of the high school, along with the sponsor's name and the sponsor's um, symbol in some cases. So um, I ask that you support this article um, and that um, uh, it's really a good thing for us to be able to raise some funds for the school. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm, we had a list before. I'm just going to go keep the list that we had and add the new people who are on. If your questions have been answered, feel free to say pass. Mr. Schlickman? Pass. Mr. Kleiman? You pass. Mr. Berkowitz? Thanks, Mr. Moderator, Bill Berkowitz, Precinct 8. I'm a little confused about the difference between the, sub the wording of the substitute and what we're, and the uh, original wording in the ARB report that we originally have. Uh, specifically, in the original ARB report, and I'm looking at uh, bottom of page 15, if people have that, where it refers to uh, changes in language of, uh, in section 7.12, and on the top of page 16, refers, <coughs> excuse me, on the top three lines, it refers to uh, page 16, uh, underlined. Each sign shall contain the name and graphical symbol of the school under sponsorship and may contain the name and trademark of the organization sponsoring the school. Uh, in the, however, in the current recommended vote, <coughs> That vote, recommended vote, seems to refer to a different section, and I'm not reading the same restriction on the signage that would be contained in that recommended vote. So as I'm reading this, and hope I can be corrected if I'm wrong, the current substitute motion is less restrictive and <clears throat> less specific than the original, uh, which seems to me a preferable way to go. Mr. Care. As I mentioned, we worked with a lot of parties in coming up with the new language. So you're right, it's a, it's a true substitute motion uh, dealing with things differently. One of the things that was of concern was uh, some uh, content regulations with respect to signs and that type of thing. So uh, in working with town council, it was determined that um, the way that it's structured now without those same restrictions was uh, a better way uh, to do it. Uh, once again, working with town council, uh, as you know, we had the issue before. Given that, it's not clear to me what types of signs would be permitted under this new substitute motion. So, for example, uh, would it be required that uh, the insignia of the school be kept as was the case in the previous uh, motion? It's our expectation, but you're correct. The bylaw does not say that. Could somebody put up a sign uh, saying, just for example, drink Coca-Cola without other mod without other language? Um, the expectation is not that, but according to this bylaw, you're correct. There's no restrictions on content. Why? We would expect the policy <laughs> of the school department okay. to address many of these different so things. You, Mr. Hanner, thinks he can answer your question. I don't know. Uh, 
Bill Hain, a precinct two and school committee member, and I would ask the other school committee members that are present to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there is a policy in the works dealing with this particular issue that would come from the school committee. I'll stand corrected <coughs> if I'm wrong on that, but it, it deals just with content in, of signs and things of this nature for the purpose of advertising on school property. And that may, and that may be, but, uh, but this is what we're voting on right here and now. I understand, but it, being school property, that the, the actual content would be con the, uh, of it, uh, further restrictions would be within the school committee's province. If your concern is that an inappropriate sign or someone else uh, <laughs> might be free to do that because you feel that it's open-ended by the bylaw, I, I tell you that the school committee will be dealing with that aspect of it, and it's not in places yet, but they have, are dealing with it in a positive manner. I hear that, and thank you, uh, but as of now, given the votes that we are called to make at this town meeting, I guess I'm regarding the original that we were asked to vote on back in the ARB report as uh, superior to the construction in this substitute, and I would want to be convinced otherwise before I could vote for this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, still ready? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I rise in support of the substitute motion of the Redevelopment Board. However, I would like to clarify a couple things, and I'm not sure if it was clear to people when this article first came up that someone made mention of the fact that the Zoning Board of Appeals has already granted a special permit for these signs or this type of signage at the high school. And through you, Mr. Moderator, I would like to ask whether Town Council believes that this, that passage of this um, uh, substitute motion of the redevelopment board is necessary. Madam Council? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town Council. Um, I'm not sure that I understand uh, what is meant by necessary, um, but I do think that the relief that the proponents were seeking, which was the right to um, put sponsorship signs up around Pierce Field, has already been granted, and that um, this zoning bylaw change is therefore superfluous. Ms. Mutter, could you, um, through you, could I ask whether Tom Council believes that it's possible for the Zoning Board of Appeals to allow non accessory signs by special permit? Ms. Rice, do you have an opinion as to that? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Juliana Rice, Town Council. Um, I do have an opinion that um, the Zoning Board of Appeals may do so. However, um, the special permit decision that I have reviewed, that I believe um, is on file with the clerk's office, the Zoning Board of Appeals granted um, the permit for these signs as accessory signs. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Um, I guess I'm, I'm really concerned about the special permit that the Zoning Board of Appeals has granted for these signs. And the reason is that in that decision, they cite a memorandum from Town Council uh, stating that in her opinion, as she just said, non-accessory signs can be permitted by special permit of the Zoning Board of Appeals. And here's the problem with that. Uh, you know, we talk about non-accessory signs it, it, that may not make a whole lot of sense to people. But both the, the best and the worst example of a non-accessory sign is a billboard. And in the Arlington Zoning Bylaw, the last section of the uh, chapter on signs is a page and a half on non-accessory signs, and it deals with the regulation of such signs, indeed the yep, regulation of, by, of, of billboards. Yeah. And it's something that our former planning director, Mr. McLennan, has put in, and it um, has withstood legal challenge, it has withstood the test of time, it has served as a model for other communities. And if you don't think it has been effective, Scope. I'd ask you to think of how many billboards, how many non-accessible signs we see in this town. Can you bring it within the scope? Yes, and I'm coming to that. And, and the opinion that Ms. Rice has just expressed and the opinion of the, of the um, Zoning Board of Appeals effectively eliminates those protections 
that Mr. McLennan has put into the zoning bylaw that have been so effective over the years. So one of the reasons I'm going to ask you to support the substitute motion of the re redevelopment board is not that it's because that it is superfluous, on the contrary. I think it's very necessary, and by approving that substitute motion, you will reduce and hopefully eliminate the, uh, any precedential value of the decision of the Zoning Board of Appeals. And in fact, at this time, that decision of the Zoning Board of Appeals is subject to uh, appeal. It's been filed with the town clerk. I believe there's a few days left for anyone to appeal it. In some ways, I hope they do, because it is such a bad decision and set such a bad precedence for the town. But if that doesn't happen, uh, and, and frankly, it's, it's probably unlikely that it will, I think it's really important that town meetings show the support for this substitute motion to negate any of the, uh, uh, or, or try to negate any of the bad precedence that that decision creates. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Um, next on the list is with Weber. Janice Weber, Precinct 21. I don't know if this is in order. Can I ask any questions about the signs rather than the zoning part? Um, are there any proposed signs yet? Very, well, I'll allow it, but let's not really get off with this. No, I let's just talk want- about the article, go ahead. I just want to know um, if the money that they're going to collect for these signs is going directly to the fees for sports. No, that's not have, that doesn't have to do with the zoning. Okay, but are we? Who's collecting the money? Yeah, no one knows. Whoever gets the signs, that's sort of school department or somebody would do that. Yeah, this would allow them to do it. But, but I don't know who actually is gonna do it. Are we going to be able to find that out at some point? Because I don't think the school committee should have any money other than the fees directly to um. The well, sporting department, the athletic department. Ms. Um, Chairman, do you have any idea? Um, Ms. Rowe, do, who's going to actually let the signs? Okay, so it's, it's actually it's the school department because it's their property. So you'd have to go to the school committee. So we have no say in where the money's going from this? Yeah, you've got to go to the school committee. We were only allowing it to happen. Mr. Um, Hander, have you voted on a procedure yet? Yes or no? They're talking about what they're going to do, I'm sure. Bill Hander, Precinct 2, on the school committee. What was your question again? Are you guys going to be the ones who um, sell the signs? I, I will stand corrected again with my other school committee members. As of right now, Money coming in under this would go to the school committee, but it is my understanding there will be a proposal from the advisory committee to set up an athletic trust, and that is these are the people that have brought forward with the re, uh, redevelopment board this article, and this would be in the future to go to that trust. Again, it will take a vote. In case Nothing has happened as yet, but this is the intent of this as of right now. Okay. And again, I will stand corrected by my school committee members. Does that answer your question, Ms. Weaver? Um, partially, but also, um, a sign's going to be, is the zoning bylaw going to affect any other fields, like Spy Pond, which isn't um, in... No, that doesn't fit the criteria. And just, Ooh, who's responsible if the signs are, you know, um, That's going to be whoever's responsible for renting them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. What? Sir, to what purpose do you rise? Point of order. That means you're like hot or cold or can't I, hear. I, well, I hope this isn't continuing debate. You can put me on the list if you like. But my understanding is the warrant article says any fenced in field with a capacity of 300 people. It's, it doesn't limit it to property under the jurisdiction of the school committee, does it? What other field in Arlington fits that description? I, I would think Spy Pond Field it's does not it. It's fenced minimum. in on all four sides. It's got a fence Did along. the article say four sides? Fenced in. Come on, if you have a pool, fenced in means all around your property. The only fence on Spy Pond Field is right in front of the Boys and Girls Club. Not Continuing along the, along bike the path. edge of the tennis courts and then back along whatever the street no, no, is there behind it. No, it ends at the tennis courts. Courts are fenced in. Okay, 
Thank you. That's the only one that fits the de definition. That's what took them three days to work on. Anything oh, else, Ms. Weaver? What about Summer Street? Isn't that fenced in? Nope. Gee, it has been ever since I've been here. Nope. Okay. Um, next on the list, Mr. Trembley. Yeah. Um, okay. Ed Trembley, Precinct 19. I, I had actually several questions. Um, Mr. L Mr. One, Trembley has the floor, please. One of them is, uh, I'm not sure why we're, could somebody answer why we're concerned about the other parks and uh, fields in town and why it's limited to just to 300 and just Pierce Field? I mean, I, I had one of, uh, one of my neighbors tell me that the, uh, even the Little League Park in Cooperstown has signs on it. And if we could generate some more money on some of the other fields, why not? Mr. Kerr? Among other things, it's the scope of the, the, scope of the Well, he, he, could, uh, he could actually make a motion to change the article to include every park in town if he wanted, and it, but that'd be kind of wild. Yeah, but, I, the scope of the article was Pierce Field, and that's what we were dealing with, um, among other things. Uh, but uh, it's also the recommended vote of the ARB to uh, uh, to accommodate uh, that particular uh, field for now. It might make sense in the future, but this is something new. And I'm I think that'd be an issue it. for another day, you're telling us. Yeah. No, I, I understand that, I, I, but I would like to, uh, to get people thinking about uh, expanding this program a little bit. Um, I had another question. How much money do you think the, uh, does the uh, school committee think that they might make from this? Mr. Harrington, you had an estimate of that, I believe. Somewhere between fifty thousand and a hundred thousand dollars per year, on an annual basis. Okay, and my recollection is that uh, that the uh, town manager said that uh, if somebody were to vandalize these sound these uh, signs, it would be the. Uh, um, town's responsibility to correct it so no, does that I, I think that's going to be one of the school committee's votes that they're going to take as they set their policies it wouldn't be the town's because it's not the town's property well or the schools is dehaner is going to give us another answer about what the school committee is going to vote on <laughs> bill hayna uh town meeting member from precinct two and just as a town meeting member with a minimal legal experience. All you have to do is write the contract and put that on the person that's renting it. If they want the sign, they're responsible for dealing with anything on it. And if they, if there's, if the sign gets tagged in the contract, it says if you don't remove it in an appropriate sign, the sign's down. So it falls to the person that's, it's the, the way the contract is written, take the burden off the person that's renting the sign, put it on the person that is, I mean, off the person's property, put it on the person that's renting it. Well, I recommend if the school committee is writing the contract, you get that in there. Mr. Trembley, continue. Well, I mean, if the school, uh, the athletic fees make a little bit of money and there's no liability, it sounds great to me. Thank you. Thank you. Madam? Yep. Is this the right microphone? You yeah, anyone you want. Susan Stamps, Precinct 3, new Arlington resident and Newtown meeting member. So, um, it, my reading of this article is that any actual permission to erect any signs is subject to a special permit. Is that correct? So Mr. K. Be, he says yes. So, if that's correct, there would be a public hearing. Uh, so there can be discussions of what the sign look the signs look like or that sort of thing. Correct. Um, I think there is some concern that this is kind of open ended in, in in the describing that the signage plan will apply to quote a fenced athletic field with a permanent structure to seat more than 300 persons. Everybody's uh, been very clear tonight that they're talking about Pierce Field. So I would move to amend this, um, our, this, this uh, motion um, to delete the two places in this motion that those words that I just uh, said 
and replace them with Pierce Field. I, I think um, before we take a second on that, that was why we adjourned, because we'd be engaging in spot zoning, which we're not allowed to do. Ms. Rice, is that true? Or am I making stuff up? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town Council. It is true, Mr. Moderator, that one of the concerns that I had raised with the proposed vote in its original form was that it would be subject to disapproval by the Attorney General as spot zoning. Ms. Stamps, you still have the floor. Well, I guess the inference is that we can't do spot zoning, so I'll uh, withdraw my um, proposed amendment. Okay, thank you. Mr. Logan? In precinct two, I just had a question. If there was any legal challenge to this, would the school committee have to deal with this or would the town? Um, it's a zoning bylaw. That would be the town's issue. Ms. Rice would have something to do for a few days. So, for example, if the school committee deemed that there was an inappropriate uh, sign placed there and someone placed a First Amendment challenge to it, the town would defend that? I don't see how they could do that, but I have no idea. I'm not going to put the cart before the horse. Just a hypothetical. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith? I don't know which Mr. Smith it was. You don't predict you don't have anything? Okay, Mr. McCabe? You wanted to talk last week. You still want to talk, Harry? No? Pass. Mr. McQuarrie? Pass. Janet Leary? Jeannie, I'm sorry. Oh, we have to wait for the mic. Um, Jeannie Leary, Precinct 19. I have a lot of concerns about this new wording of uh, fence field with, I, see, I can't even read this. I wish we had it handed out. But it, a fenced athletic field with a permanent structure to seat more than 300 persons. To me, this could mean the Summer Street field because the rink can fit more than 300 people, even though they're not with the field even though they're not with the baseball field. And as in a direct abutter to the, the uh, Summer Street fields, I think as taxpayers, the residents who live around the sports complex put up with a great deal of late night noise. We have two lit baseball fields. We have the ring going past midnight, 10 I don't, months I don't here. think that the, well, first, Summer Street's not fenced in on all four sides, so it wouldn't, and well, it, I think it's specifically... Well, Bucksfield is, isn't it? Um, it doesn't, Ms. Jim? Mr. Kerr, would the skating rink qualify the Summer Street Field under you, the way this is written and the way the board would and issue the special permit? outside bleacher on it and we would not consider the rink seating to be part of the athletic field oh good oh good I'm glad to hear that because yeah. they did put up signs there years ago y and then yeah. okay don't don't know about years ago I really liked your approach when you were saying that you were gonna have the signs face the spectators you know so they weren't facing mm -hmm. people's homes because it, you know no one wants to look out the windows at billboards you know so that was very nice the way you said you were gonna do that and I appreciate that I was just envisioning these billboard signs all over the place, and I just wanted to clarify that. Great. And I, one other point. I did watch the school committee meeting when they brought this up um, about the vote. And to me, um, it, I forget your name, sorry. Um, it appeared very ambiguous what, where the funds were going to go, how it was going to be handled. The, you know, it, it was very, very ambiguous. I was kind of surprised that they knew so little about it. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Joe Coral. Uh, Joe Coral, 21 Millet Street, <clears throat> member of the Arlington School Committee. Um, I just stand to, uh, I, I believe this may have been stated at, uh, when this article originally came up. I just wanted to make clear 
the school committee does support the article that is before you, we would ask you to, uh, to uh, pass this. I think you've heard the estimate of the Athletic Advisory Committee on the potential revenue. I think you all know also the strain that we've been under. Um, we've tried very hard not to um, uh, cut any of our sports uh, offerings, but that's come at a great cost uh, to the participants uh, in the form of increased um, athletic fees. I know there are a lot of questions about the direction of fees. That's not the purview of this article, uh, but just <clears throat> so you know, that would uh, require a vote of the school committee to appropriate those funds. Um, I believe it's been this, the sense of our discussions that those funds would be directed towards um, fee relief, but again, that, that would require debate um, and a vote of the school committee. Uh, there is also an alternate um, uh, approach which we could take and which I expect we would be discussing with the Athletic Advisory Committee, which would be the potential of um, uh, entering a memorandum of understanding with the um, Arlington Sports Foundation has been newly created, which um, may act, uh, could potentially act as the, the agent for um, uh, um, selling the advertising here um, uh, under a, a, an MOU with the school department and an understanding of, um, of uh, where funds might be directed. Um, as far as the, uh, the type of advertising that would be allowed, um, you know, Mr. Hayner is uh, correct. We do have a policy on uh, advertising um, on the sports fields. It does require that any uh, signage be in good taste. It also um, uh, gives the superintendent the authority to implement uh, procedures to um, ensure that as well. So uh, that is um, the way that we uh, handle that, that, that's delegated to the superintendent. Um, however, it is possible and it is in our purview to uh, place more specific uh, restrictions on the um, uh, on the types of advertising that might might appear as well through policy um, so I hope that that um, adds a little bit of light to some of the questions that have arisen but I would ask the, uh, to please um, vote affirmatively on the uh, the the article and I want to thank the redevelopment board and especially mr. care for all of the uh, and uh, Ms. Rice for all of the work they've gone, uh, they've put into this, and, and uh, Mr. Harrington for bringing it forward. Thank you. Thank you. You can see me during the break. All right, well. Yeah. Barbara Bolt, Precinct 9, you keep referring to a fenced-in athletic field, but the motion says a fenced athletic field, which is quite a different matter. And well, so, I will inquire what they mean by fenced. So that, and then also, uh, 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 Nigley, uh, Ms. Ms. Bolt, you're on you're the uh, list. Grammar thing, if you're going to say one or more, you have to put an S in a, po in a, a parentheses after the word structure. You cannot say one or more permanent structure. It has to be the S in a apostrophe right. is not there. Thank you. Thank you. We'll make that change if it's deemed correct. This gentleman right back here in the next to the yes, you. Then we're going to take a break after you. Yep. Pass. Pass. Ah. OK, we're going to take a break. Come back in 10 minutes.
Celtics or was 97, 97. Season ends for Celtics. I don't have to worry about how much LeBron sucks. Yeah. And the Red Sox. Please come in. Yes, sir. Please, please come take your seats. <laughs> Ms. Rice has further pointed out to me in answer to Ms. Bolt's question, Pierce Field is the only one that further qualifies as it's a, um, and Ms. Leary's question, it's the only one in an R1 zone. All, no other fields are within the R1, which it specifies in the vote. So, um, Mr. Good? Where'd he go? Hey, Andy, is Dave Good out there? Yeah. Mr. Good, you were the next on the list. Okay. All right. So we're going to have to then entertain a motion from Mr. Tosti to table. You want Minuteman? This could, yeah, it's going to move for a while. You want me to table or try moving the question? You're not up, Les. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I ask you, um, the superintendent from Minuteman has been here. Uh, I ask for your permission uh, to put articles um, 22 through well, 17, we're on 17, yeah, 17 now, right? 17 and articles 22 through 60 uh, back up, uh, on the table in order to take up article 61, the Minuteman assessment. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So tabled. Mr. Moderator, um, for myself, Steve DeCourcy from the Finance Committee and the Superintendent. I asked for an additional five minutes. I don't think we'll use it, but uh, we'd like a total of 15 minutes for the three of us. Uh, second. second. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? You have your 15 minutes, sir. Okay. Uh, I would like to ask Steve DeCourcy to come before the uh, committee to discuss uh, the reasons for the Finance Committee's support of the Minuteman budget. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve DeCourcy, Precinct 2. Uh, the Finance Committee is recommending an appropriation for Minuteman this year of $2,352,988. Uh, that's a decline of about 14% from the appropriation last year. And I'm just going to walk through briefly what the, how the appropriation or the assessment for Arlington is determined. Um, last year, it's, it's based on the enrollment uh, of in-district members, communities, as of October 1st. And as of October 1st, 2010, there were 115 full-time equivalent students from Arlington. The year before, there were 131. So there's been a decline in the Arlington population. However, there's been an increase in the in-district enrollment, which is a, a, a very good news for Arlington because we are a smaller percentage of the overall district at this point. A year ago, we were at 430 for in-district. Um, this past year is 445, so the district has actually increased by 3%. We've gone down, and as our percentage has gone down, our assessment has gone down. Um, one other thing to uh, wanted to point out, we're voting a number, which is the Arlington assessment. By voting the Arlington assessment, we're actually voting acceptance of the Minuteman budget. And the Minuteman budget this year, uh, I will introduce Dr. Boquillen, who will run through that with you. Um, the overall budget for Minuteman this year is $16.4 million. It's an increase of 1% uh, from last year, just over 1% from, from a year ago. Um, Dr. Boquillen will run through numbers for the past few years, but he has been on the job for four years. He's going into his fifth year, and since he has taken over at Minuteman, um, we have had the pleasure of, of, of meeting with him every year. And, 
Every year he brings us better news in terms of what the assessments per pupil is doing. It's, it's, it's coming down. The number of students at the school has, has gone up. And um, while it's not perfect and while there are a lot of people with, that, that would like to see the, the um, per pupil numbers even lower, it's a, it's a very positive trend and, and it's, a, it's been a very good working relationship that we've had with Minuteman and, and we look forward to continuing that relationship uh, going forward. So at, at this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ed Boquillen, uh, the superintendent of Minuteman and uh, visiting his 16th community tonight. Not, not all on the same evening, but this is the last town meeting that he's visiting. <laughs> Dr. Boquillen. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Steve and Al. Um, I'm going to go briefly through the slides, and I'm pardoned if I turn around. Next slide. Uh, this is our mission. I'm, I'm not. I reordered the slides because it made more sense, so I'm not used to this yet, even though this is my last town meeting. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Recently, enrollment trends. Uh, Steve mentioned um, our enrollment, and I want to uh, give you some good news and some okay news. Next slide. Uh, you can see overall the district is up about 10 percent. Our member towns are up about 3 percent. We've had an increase in non-member communities as well as what we call the big three, um, which is Waltham, Watertown, and Medford. Um, we're continuing to make some efforts in terms of recruiting and marketing and accessing more families and talking about Minuteman, and we've really appreciated the cooperation we've had in Arlington. It's been exemplary. Next slide. If we break down this year's enrollment increase, I'll just uh, ask you to look at the first gray bar, which looks at our freshman class. You can see that we've had a 63% increase in our freshman class this year. Um, our 9 through 12 enrollment was up slightly, about 6%. Member and non-member postgraduate students were up significantly, about 17% from member towns and uh, almost doubled from non-member uh, communities as well. I'll talk a little bit more about our postgraduate um, tuition initiative in a moment. But overall our headcount is up about 11 percent. And I put the freshman retention rate on there because that's one of the uh, goals that I'm evaluated on as superintendent and it went up 106 percent. Next slide. Um, these are some of the achievements of our students. Um, I'm hoping as the years go by and our enrollment and, uh, goes up and our finances get more in line, I'll spend more time on this, but we've had a, a great class last year. 72% of them, I believe, went on to continuing education in two-year and four-year institutions, the highest in the state of Massachusetts. 19% directly into work. I think that's a reflection of the economy. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is another look at our placement rate over the last four years. Overall, about a 96% placement rate. Next slide. This is our special ed enrollment. It's a little difficult to see, but Minuteman is on the far right. Um, and all the way going to the far left are some other vocational technical schools. And Arlington is on the far left. Minuteman has about 47% of the student body on an IEP. It's the highest in the state as well. But I'm also proud to report that this year 100% of our 10th graders passed the MCAS English Language Arts on the first try. 97% passed the math on the first try. Thank you. Next slide. Cost control initiatives. Next slide. Um, this is our five-year historical budget. You can see um, after several years of increases, um, this year that we're in in particular, we um, made some pretty significant reductions to right size Minuteman. We, our budget was reduced by about 7%. Um, next year we're anticipating a 1% increase in our overall budget at 16.4 million, still lower than five years ago. Next slide. We've done this through a combination of attrition and active riffing. Our overall professional staff um, is down over the last few years, but it's down in a way that has not hurt students, has not hurt student performance, um, and we need to continue to do this and be mindful of it as we right-size the building. When I say right-size, we have the right amount of staff, the right mix of programs, and I think that's a cost-effective way to continue. Next slide. 
administration. We've uh, cut our administration in half over the last five years. I'll let you know next year if that was a good move. Next slide. And this is a real telling uh, figure. This is the actual dollars of salary that we spend, the total dollars of salary. And you look next year, we'll be at 9.1 million of salary, and that's lower than we were by over a million dollars five years ago. Next slide. This looks at our foundation rates in comparison to other regional vocational schools as well as the state average of vocational education in general. And you can see Minuteman in the blue is about 14900 a few hundred dollars above the average regional career and technical high school. There are 26 regional career and technical high schools in Massachusetts. The state average for vocational is down a bit because it accommodates all the different models by which regional vocational, uh, by models that vocational education is delivered, including collaboratives and comprehensive high schools and smaller city vocational schools. Uh, as we have in Waltham and Medford and Newton. Next slide. Right sizing. Next slide. Um, one of the impacts, of course, of increasing enrollment and reducing staffing is that our um, student to teacher ratios by class size is, is coming back up to where it should be. The dark blue on the left is last year. The lighter blue is this year that we're in right now. And you can see in math and science we've had a an increase in the average class size. And I'll remind you that 47% of those classes have students that are in uh, receiving special services of some kind. Next slide. Uh, this is just another look at what the uh, budgeted per pupil increase had been over the last few years and where uh, we see it going in the trend line. Next year, FY12, we're um, very conservative in our estimates of about a 2% increase in enrollment. We're on track for uh, a larger increase than that. Right now as we look at the freshman class for next year we have 350 applications for about 240 uh, openings. So we're going to have a real waiting list it looks like and that will be mostly non-member students. Our member students are now in a place where we have to give those students priority and we're turning away others because of that. On the postgraduate side, our applications have increased 300% from last year to this year. These are adults that come to Minuteman um, and receive a vocational technical education, and we are going to be beginning to charge them um, tuition, which I'll talk about in a minute. Next slide. <clears throat> There's still a strong belief that it's cheaper to be a non-member than a member of the Minuteman Regional School District. Next slide. You can see over the last few years we've tried to change that dynamic. So towns that are not members of Minuteman are paying significantly more next year. Um, the average student, which is the lower uh, cost, is about $23,500. And if that student is on an IEP, it's about 26000 This is the total cost to that non-member district. We charge a base tuition next year of about 18000 uh, $100. If the student is on an IEP, there's another $5,000 on top of that. And then the district has to pick up all the transportation costs associated with that, which average about $3,000, $3,200 per student. So there are uh, benefits of membership. Next slide. Coming to the budget, next slide. Uh, when we began our budget process, we looked at a level service budget of about $17.1 million. Knowing what all the towns are going through this year, we, I knew that wouldn't fly. So we, and that represented about a 5% increase in our budget. We looked at uh, other reductions. Uh, I'm reducing another administrator. Um, my assistant superintendent principal position has been eliminated. It'll be replaced with an interim principal for next year, but the assistant superintendent position is gone. So um, I have no more assistant superintendents after uh, July 1. We looked at uh, teacher reductions, support staff reductions, uh, and we're looking at one or two uh, program reductions in terms of what we offer. Um, so our budget overall is up about 1.1% from this year. Next. This is the uh, revenue plan. You can see uh, assessments, the top line are assessments to our member communities. Uh, we're anticipating uh, a slight reduction in Chapter 70 aid 
Um, this is not as low as it could be because we have more students. Regional transportation aid we're assuming is level funded. And that line item over the last four years has gone from about $900,000 to $495,000. The state's only reimbursing us about 53% of our actual costs to transport students from the 16 member towns. Uh, prior year and current year tuition, you can see uh, we're trending to rely less on current year tuition. This is what we collect from non-member communities. We use it in the revenue plan to offset the assessments from the our member towns. Uh, member postgraduate tuition, $75,000. Prior to this year, FY12, um, the member towns have picked up the cost of an adult coming back to school. Um, there was a strong um, argument made, and I agreed with it, that all postgraduate students should be paying their tuition. So over the next four years, we will be increasing the amount of tuition charged to adults, uh, beginning with FY12, and that represents about 25% of the average postgraduate tuition, which is only $5,000. So next year, we'll charge 50%. We'll reevaluate its impact on applications, which it doesn't seem to have any impact. And over by FY16, we'll be up to 100%. And so no member town will be paying twice to educate a person in their school. Um, there was a great argument made that they've gone through the Arlington Public Schools. Why are we paying for them again to go into Minuteman? So we're changing that. While we did that, we also did three steps to help people pay for their tuition. One is all our programs now are approved by the VA. So returning veterans and veterans can use their GI benefit to pay the tuition at Minuteman. Um, it was a long, arduous task, but we got it done. We also have set up a prepayment plan like folks do with um, college tuition. And we're also now eligible under Title IV for Pell Grants and student loans to be used to pay that tuition. Next slide. Um, this is the last slide, I believe, and it's uh, reflective of the assessment that we're asking for this year. And you can see uh, there's been a decline over the last few years, and a per-pupil decline is what we're really looking at because that, I think, is telling the tale best of all. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Doctor? No. Okay. I'll answer any questions, though, Mr. Moderator. Sure. Um, Mr. Carmen? Dean Carmen, Precinct 20, and a member of the Finance Committee. I, I stand tonight in very strong support for this budget, and, you know, normally I wouldn't get up for that, but equally important, I stand in very strong support in respect and admiration for this superintendent. When, you, when I look at this budget historically, when I first joined the Finance Committee, this was the budget I dreaded the most, and why. If you look at, if you take out your Minuteman handout that we got a few, a few nights back, and you go to page nine, what you notice is over a 15-year history, steadily declining enrollment. So enrollment on the 15-year chart peaks at 933 students and is in steady decline. So your mind would say to you, okay, well, if it's in steady decline, then the costs have to be somewhat steady because if student enrollment's going down, even with inflation, things can't be going up that quickly. If you flip the next page to page 11, you see that's not true. What you see is that costs continue to rise. And what really impacted Arlington in a, in a truly negative way was even though the overall enrollment at Minuteman was going down, our Arlington enrollment, if you went back to page nine, wasn't going down. So we were getting a larger and larger share of an increase in cost. The school got to a point five years ago where it was the most expensive school in the state. The costs were out of control. And as a finance committee member, we used to have the, have the superintendent of Minuteman every year and beg him, plead with him, ask him to right-size the school. And he would basically tell us to go pound sand and walk out and, you know, essentially say, well, I can get the other 12 member communities, all I need is 12, I don't need you, good luck. And so it was a very frustrating time for me, and I'm, you know, I'm sure for many people in town meeting, it was a very frustrating time for you. So Bowden, I can't believe it's four years now, you know, Dr. McQuellen showed up, 
We have our finance committee reorganization meeting in the fall. First meeting, he asked if he could come, come to it and talk to us. So comes to our meeting, he asks us one question. What do you want? What can I do? And, you know, unfortunately for him, years and years of frustration, we unloaded on him. And we said, <laughs> your school enrollment is going down, your costs are going up, you have programs that have very small numbers of students in them, and you're doing nothing about, your predecessor did nothing about it. And so if you look at the data that he presented, what, what the superintendent of Minuteman has done is steadily over years bend the cost curve, increase enrollment, and it has had a very positive result. We have not seen significant increases in the Arlington appropriation. We have not seen significant increases in the school. Clearly, as we all know, when you have tight fiscal resources, especially in the environment he's been doing it in with the general economy down, this is a very big achievement, and it's a very important achievement, because if we were standing here not with a, let's say, 14% decrease in our Minuteman assessment, but we were sitting here with a 14% increase in our Minuteman assessment, we would also be seeing other areas of our general fund where we would have to cut and we would have to lose more services. And so with that as the backdrop, I would ask everybody to support this budget. I would ask everybody to support this superintendent. I am sure when you go through a process of right-sizing a school, you don't make a lot of friends you don't become the most popular person in the school. So, you know, like I said, I'd ask you to support the budget and support the superintendent. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, member of the Minuteman School Committee from 1997 through 2001. And those were the years sort of the left where things were totally out of control. Those were the years when 47% of the students were, non -mem uh, were member town students, and a third of them were enrolling under school choice at $5,000 apiece. That's no longer happening. The economics have reversed. Non-member towns are paying more than we're paying. The ship has been righted. We've looked, they've looked at the programs there and determined what programs are viable and stopped running expensive programs that were not fiscally viable. The ship has been righted. Uh, the management is, is truly become responsive to the member towns where the previous administration was very introspective in, in looking at the school and could count on the support of 11 very small member towns to create the two-thirds majority they needed to get things done. The ship has been righted. We have something to be very proud of. Not only do we have the best vocational school in the state, but is now being run efficiently in a fair manner where the leadership of this district cares about its large member towns and its small member towns and is making sure that they are responsive to both the students who are coming from our communities and to the voters and taxpayers who have to support them. It is very, very worthwhile to vote for this budget. It is a dream from my first 10 years as a town meeting member, uh, the years before I became a member of that school committee, where this would be an utter nightmare, where we would spend over a night just debating a budget that we couldn't disapprove because we already had 11 member towns that had approved it and we were just frustrated. Now we are proud. Now we are being listened to. This bu budget deserves our support. I only caution you on one thing. As those numbers have changed, as it's become more expensive for the non-member towns to go and send kids, it will become a better deal for these non-member towns to come and join the district, which will require unanimous consent to amend the regional agreement. Some of the communities there are cities. They don't have moderators to a point. We're going to need to change the governance structure in some manner. And I want you to take a look at, on page 9, look at Dover. When I was there, we had a uh, child at Minuteman who had his own personal school committee member. 
Uh, the ratio between Arlington and Dover's representation on the Minuteman School Committee and thus in the vote in governance. One town, one vote. Dover has one vote. We have one vote. Uh, we range anywhere from 150 to one. No, actually, it's error to one because in 2008, they had zero students. No kids, but still a vote. That's, that's kind of interesting. We, I, I hope that the message that comes back from, from this meeting, that while we're pleased about this, while we have an exceptional superintendent and great management that has righted the ship, these things can go astray, and that as we're looking to attract new member districts, who may very well be cities, that we're looking at some of the governance structures to make sure that a town like Arlington, which is a major contributor, or maybe some of the uh, surrounding communities that might want to join this wonderful school, because it's cheaper to join, uh, will uh, have a reason to do so and not fear being outvoted by the Dovers of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chappett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Roland Chapman, Precinct 12. Uh, I, I stand to support this budget, and I commend Dr. Bukalian for the, the effort that he's put into Minuteman School. Uh, uh, you may recall last year I told you that I visited up there a few weeks before our town meeting. What impressed me the most was the attitude, not only of the kids, but the teachers. It was a very positive message that was coming back. And so I didn't go this year, but I'm sure it's the same or even better than it was uh, 12 months ago. Um, one of the issues that we talked about briefly last year, and I was going to ask the doc Dr. McKeon to uh, uh, respond to this, if I may, Mr. Moderator. If you look on page three, mission and district goals, go down to G. Complete phase one of MSBA, feasibility study and deliver enrollment study, et cetera, et cetera. Could you give us a couple of positive remarks about just how that's going on? Doctor? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, in page three, I don't have it in front of me, but in regards to the, uh, the regional agreement task force, which was looking at our um, budget, uh, our regional agreement, I'm sorry, I'm just so overwhelmed by all this wonderful talk here. Uh, I'd I really like a copy of this. <laughs> uh, the regional agreement task force, which was Arlington was well represented by Mr. Tosti, has met for over the last 14 months and came up with some final recommendations that my school committee is now considering. <clears throat> In regards to the enrollment study, NESDEC completed the uh, New England School Development Council completed a very in-depth analysis of our enrollment study and are projecting that by the year 2015, the school will have met its planned effective operating capacity, which they have set at 950. <clears throat> so we're well on the track to um, uh, moving forward with the next phase of a feasibility study, which is to hire an owner's project manager and a design firm to understand what the scope of a renovation would be. We're not going to build a new school. That's not necessary. Um, also, in regards to our strategic plan and educational plan, we've identified three new program areas um, to replace the four or five that we will have closed by the end of this fiscal year. And those new program areas are exciting, and so I'm going to mention to them tonight. One of them is animal science, believe it or not. Um, the second one is uh, biosecurity and criminal justice. And the third program area is uh, the technical theater arts. And we're very um, thrilled about those and looking forward to um, working with the designers around what a, a new Minuteman might look like. I don't expect to come back to any town meeting until 2014, perhaps even 2015, with a, a real approved scope of work. And I'm going to be working very closely with the town managers and the FinComs and the capital planning committees of all our 16 towns to make sure that we build it right and that we build it to serve our children going forward for the next 50 years because we need it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. O'Connor. Jim O'Connor, Precinct 19. Sometimes 
you hear other members say exactly what you want to say, and Roly and I were at that meeting, and I can't say more about Mr. Bakoyan and his willingness to show us around, work on the physical plant, and he's a, um, a star example of things we could do in Arlington to improve our own physical plight. Thank you. Madam? Pass. Ms. Weber? And Mr. Jamison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. I had a couple quick questions. Um, I, too, am in awe of the uh, superintendent's uh, hard work and how this both uh, he's progressed uh, the school financially as well as uh, um, with the students. So um, I had a question um, on his slide where he discussed uh, the, prior, the current year tuition. So if I understood correctly, we're paying about 20,000 and the out of districts were in the 23 to 26 range. But I have, I have a hard time understanding that when I see the current year tuition at $1.3 million. So, uh, so where, where does the 20000 or $24,000 that all those out-of-district people, is that, is that uniform or is that just proposed? Um, there are two communities that are under a long-term agreement where they get a slight discount on tuition. Yeah. Um, though, because they send us a minimum of 50 students, they get $1,500 off the base tuition. The other place that may be a little confusing is that the number of students who are on IEPs their assessment of $5,000 per pupil goes into um, another area that's not clearly identified in the current year tuition. But in general, the Minuteman has relied more on prior year tuition. So in other words, the money we collect this year, we would use in FY13's uh, budget. We have chosen to use more current year tuition the previous two fiscal years really to keep assessments down to the member towns. It's not a sustainable accounting practice that we want to do. It's like continuing to draw down your reserve accounts right. yeah. or your free cash accounts. You just can't do that, but you have them there, so let's use them, and that was our approach. Okay, even with that, even with that um, uh, explanation, I see the prior year tuition was $3 million and the assessments is $9 million. Yet I got the impression that the out of districts are paying twenty three to twenty six thousand dollars per student while we're only paying twenty. So I'm confused by that. I guess I'm having trouble understanding the question. Well, so, Is it it's so a the, math the, question? Well, so because because the, there's four hundred and forty five students in from member towns from member towns, and that's the nine million plus. Yes. And then there's uh, th um, three hundred and nine. And my rough estimate is that's about three quarters the number. And so I'm questioning why the other, other towns are not paying six. Like two thirds or three quarters of nine would, would be the, mm -hmm. a, a prorated amount for the other, other towns. So somebody's getting a discount is what I, I'm confused by that. We can talk about this offline. Yeah, I'm not Because I don't think this is going anywhere. Okay. My business manager isn't here with me tonight. No, that's, so. that's not a problem. Um, um, and then the next thing is, is this wonderful map that you provided uh, us with this year, which is, I found to be quite um, instructive. We've heard all these comments about other people should join. Mm. And, and further to Mr. Slickman's comment, the, the real reason I wanted to get up here other than try to figure out that thing, which obviously we're not going to figure out tonight, is, is what can we do mm. to help you? Since you know, you've asked the Finance Committee, you know, how can you help us? Mm. My question is, what can we do to help you? Is there some type of home rule petition that all these communities could file that would, that would allow us to uh, enlarge the district? How, how can we help you? Maybe that's something you have to go back and think about. But if there's some article or Warren articles that we need to pass that would help you, I, I, per, I personally would be very receptive to that. Well, I appreciate the question. I think um, I'll give you, there's two dimensions, what you could do now. Um, there are a number of meetings being held around the state around under the umbrella of regionalization. And I think some of the talk around regionalization um, needs to be informed by members of regional vocational technical school districts because there's not a lot of strong voices talking about regionalization within those discussions because there are obviously people, towns near us that would benefit from, from being a part of our 
uh, uh, district, but there's no incentive for them to do that other than the incentive we're trying to create. So there may be some opportunities there to talk about that. I think in the long term, um, in the fall or in the spring when we come with a change in our district agreement, we'll have a whole package that we're going to be uh, explaining that will provide some incentives within that package. So passing that district agreement change would probably be the most helpful thing we could be doing um, to expand the region in a sensible way. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. I move the question. Okay. Motion second. Motion to terminate debate. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. Debate is terminated. We have before us the recommended vote of the Finance Committee to fund $2,352,988 to Minuteman Vocational Tech. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. Unanimous vote, and I so declare. Doctor, you have your money. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Sir, purpose you rise. Mr. Moderator, Mike Healy, Precinct 13. I'd like to take Article 17 off the table. I think you beat Mr. Tosti by three seconds. All in favor of taking 17 off the or table? Can, can we do the whole thing? Huh? Can we do the whole thing? Yeah, let's take all of them off the table. Yeah, um, I move that articles 17 and 22 through 60, except for articles 31, 34, and 35, which were already on the table before, be taken from the table. Second. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. That brings us back to 17. Um, Mr. Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. Uh, earlier this evening, a gentleman asked a question about tagging, and I had raised the same question on a previous evening, and town manager was kind enough to clear up the subject that in the event of a sign at Pierce Field being tagged, it would be the town's responsibility to repair such sign. Now, I granted that could be later changed if the school committee does some procedures, but I'm happy with his answer as of right now that the town would be responsible. Uh, second question, I've noticed on some of the slides up here that they've shown of the signs that it, are going to be put up, are supposedly going to be put up, that the signs are basically stating like Big A in red and white for Arlington. And I'm wondering if there's a misconception in town meeting that these signs are going to be supporting Arlington functions, places, clubs, and then in small lettering, the sponsor will be labeled in the small lettering, or as some people might be thinking, is the person sponsoring going to have the sole possession of the sign? We're, we're not debating what the signs look like this evening. We're strictly allowing the signs to go up. But what, what the signs will look like is going to be up to the special permit seekers and the ARB, if that's who's going to grant these things, and the school committee and their regulations for the signs. I'm just wondering if that point could be cleared up that is the sign. Yeah, we're not voting on anything you've seen here except for those words. But yet They've showed you pretty pictures. They're not what we're voting on. All right, but I mean, you could be led to believe that the, the, the pretty pictures was what the signs would be looking like, is yeah, what I'd, I'm getting at. I would take those strictly as theoretical examples, not what they're guaranteeing they're going to look like. All right, because again, like I'm saying, yeah. uh, the content of the sign is it for the benefit of Arlington or for the benefit of the sponsor? Is where I'm confused. I would say the benefit of the sponsors. Why the hell would you put money on there? Because uh, they say the sign was a little bit deceiving. The last question is where these signs are going to be, okay? Where I'm a little bit confused, 
uh, would the signs be placed on individual, would they be placed on the existing fencing around the Pierce Field in full view of, let's say, people in the stands, or would they be on both sides of existing fencing, which would, to me would be like an eyesore. Mr. Ca Mr. Kerr, what do you envision the placement of these signs to look like? It would all be subject to the special permit and the hearings and everything else. Um, plans that we've seen are more centered on the field themselves, but those are preliminary everything else. It is, and nothing's come before us. So, you know, it, it's all subject to that uh, special permit process. So you're not saying whether you're actually going to erect structures that are going to carry the signs, or you're going to have the signs hanging off the existing fencing? Uh, I think the expectation is the latter, but nothing's come before us yet. So, I mean, we need this in order to have that conversation. Okay, then I would be, I'd be curious. I mean, I know more discussion is necessary on this, but I would be curious that if they did go on the existing fencing, it would be overkill on both sides of the fence all the way around the field. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. I move to terminate debate on the question. And all articles, all issues before us? Okay. Motion to terminate debate on the article and all issues before it. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Okay. We have two votes. Oh, that was loud. Everybody who doesn't want to terminate debate, please say no. Okay. Sorry about that. Debate is terminated. Um, we have before us two votes. A substitute by the um, Arlington Redevelopment Board, which is dated May 4th. And, we, and then there was their original vote. First, we're going to vote on their substitute vote. That's what I mean. The, amend the substitute motion is the amendment. What amendment? Oh, the red? Yeah. I was going to allow that administratively. The... The one or more permanent is because that's, um, I'll take a vote on that if you want. I, mean, I thought it was administrative. All in favor of the substitute motion, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. My opinion, it is substituted. We now have the main vote as substituted. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. Okay, this is zoning, so it's a two thirds. So all in favor, please rise. <laughs> Same tellers, please. Nine. Up front, hold a fucking yes, no. We have nine up front. Mr. Schlickman? 26. 26. Mr. O'Connor? 29. 29. Mr. Trembley? 31. And Mr. Um, McCabe? 38. 38. All opposed, please rise. Up front? Zero. Zero. Mr. Schlickman? Zero. Zero. Mr. O'Connor? Zero. Zero. Mr. Trembley? Two. Two. Mr. McCabe? One. One. It is a positive vote, 133 <coughs> to three. It passes. That brings us to Article 22, bylaw amendment town meeting standing vote. Um, recommended vote, this was originally brought by the town meeting procedure committee. The selectmen have a recommended vote as printed in their report. Um, Mr. O'Connor, would you like to address it? James O'Connor. Precinct 19, Town Meeting Procedures Committee. 
I find myself in agreement with the Board of Selectmen and probably 99.9% .9 of this body here that we would like to propose this um, warrant article be passed for the reasons that it would expedite voting counts so that in instances just like the one we just had, if there is a supermajority required of the body, that we don't have to count every vote if we have more than the required amount. So I would ask you to consider this. I know that if prior meeting we were asked to move this matter forward, but it wasn't timely at that moment for the moderator's decision. So please vote in favor of this along with the Board of Selectmen and the Town Meeting Procedures Committee. Thank you. In this matter of information to the meeting, we've had 11 such lopsided votes so far this meeting. Anyone else wish to address the issue? Mr. Berkowitz? Precinct 8, I would just like to clarify that under this uh, proposal, we would still be permitted to doubt the vote by five people standing, is that correct? Correct. And you could even still have a roll call with 30. Mr. McCorry? Hugh McCrory, Precinct 20. Um, and also a member of the uh, Town Procedures Committee. Uh, actually, when we, the committee took the vote, I believe I was the only dissenting voice on this uh, when we took the vote. Um, I guess I have since changed my mind uh, I, I, um, based on my experience at Town Meeting. Um, yeah, I guess the reason why I voted against it wasn't uh, because of uh, the moderator, but it's just in the future. But uh, I guess I have faith in, in, our, uh, in our excellent moderator and uh, the town in general. So I actually urge you to uh, support the, uh, this uh, article, as I will be doing. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. McCoy. Mr. Fiore? Peter Fiore, Precinct 2. Uh, it's, it's late, and, and I can't think straight. Can you just explain to me how this changes what, what we do now? I, I, I just want to understand. I'm not, I'm not really clear that it, how it changes business the way we um, do now. <clears throat> right now, the moderator can declare a majority vote and a unanimous vote. So if we're doing zoning bylaws that require a two-third vote, say, if it's Anything less than unanimous, I can't, or any moderator cannot declare it. We have to have a two-third vote, so that's why we have to keep doing standing votes for those folks who decide they want to vote no. The moderator would be able to declare a two-third vote by the voice vote if, in his opinion, it is two-thirds vote. And we'll have to go through the same colloquy with the clerk as we do now for unanimous that there are 85 members present in voting and that in my opinion it is a two-third vote it can be challenged by the five um, voters who would five members who would stand and challenge the vote we don't lose that right at all um, otherwise our voting procedures would remain the same it would just give that little bit of extra and this is provided by state law and I did a survey through the moderator gavel line almost every other representative town meeting around us, actually all of them, have this article and they use it. It's, um, they find it very effective. They can't believe we didn't have it. Um, so it's, all it would change is give me and, and future moderators the right to declare a two-third vote. Just on the vote we just had, 133 to um, three. I could declare that a two-third vote. We could move on. Every time, in my opinion, we do a standing vote between the initial vote, the standing, the counting, the standing, the counting, it takes anywhere up to five minutes. So that's over an hour of time that we've spent doing that exercise. So okay, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else wish to discuss the article? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed, say no. 
In my opinion, that is a positive vote. That brings us to Article 24. Bylaw Amendment Public Records. Recommend a vote of the, Mr. Loretti. Recommend a vote of the selectmen. There's no action. Mr. Loretti. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I have a substitute motion I'd like to introduce uh, for this article I distributed on Monday. I'd like to move that uh, substitute motion. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have a second? Yes, Thank you. I submitted this article because I believe there needs to be a better understanding of the public record flow within the town. And among sub-public officials, there needs to be a change in attitude about providing public records. At a uh, recent uh, town meeting, someone spoke of the us versus them, them dynamic that was taking place in town meeting. Unfortunately, I think that sometimes occurs with public records as well. Public records are not their records, they are our records. But if you read the selectmen's report on this article, they talk about keeping the fees for public records high enough to serve as a natural gatekeeper for, to, uh, to prevent too much access. So the thought is, unless you really want them and are willing to pay our price, you can't have them. I reject that attitude. I think a more appropriate way to think of public records is the way we think of materials in the library. Access, is to, access to them is provided without regard to who is asking or what is being asked for. It's done at the lowest possible cost and as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, responses to public records requests in Arlington are too often handled not as routine administrative matters, but rather as political matters. I'll have more to say about that, but first I want to talk about the resolution itself. It begins with a series of, of whereases, which for the most part are taken uh, or borrowed from the Secretary of the Commonwealth's Guide to the Public Records Law. Uh, Crap. And there are a couple others that are simply uh, things that I would regard as uh, good customer service and good management. I hope they're not controversial. But I'd like to turn to the resolves in the substitute motion and the resolution and why I think they're necessary. And these resolves are informed by my own experience in making a public records request for emails from last October and the subsequent need to appeal the, the response to that request to the Secretary, I'm sorry, to the Supervisor of Records and the Secretary of the Commonwealth's Office, as well as to the, uh, and it's also informed by the experience of others who have made requests both on the town side and on the school side, and in particular for email requests. And I mention both sides because we actually have two different email systems in town that, that are not compatible, they're not the same. So the first resolve talks about the town accepting the offer of free training on the public records law from the state. And I think that's, it's important to do that. I think it's a good idea to request that town officials make use of that training because in my experience, the public records law really isn't fully understood in this town. And I want to give you a few examples of that. I spoke to one individual who worked in the IT department a decade ago, and he said as early as 2002, it was understood that in order to be compliant with state law, archives of emails had to be searchable. When I made my request back in October on the town side, the town did not yet have a searchable archiving system in for its emails. When I presented on this article at town meeting, I'm sorry, before the selectmen, one of the selectmen asked town council if records that or emails that happened to be embarrassing couldn't be withheld. Fortunately, town council corrected her. And I think you know, one of the reasons people make public records requests is they want to get to the truth of the way the, the town government operates. And they don't want to listen or simply accept kind of the public relations presentation we too often get. I think there's also a, a misunderstanding of when you can use um, attorney client privilege to restrict access to emails. When I questioned town council earlier this evening about the Zoning Board of Appeals decision, I had asked her for her memorandum to that board and she, she denied it on the basis of attorney client privilege. That memorandum was made part of the public record for that, uh, for that decision by the Zoning Board of Appeals. It was distributed to all of the Zoning Board of Appeals members. It was, in every respect, a public record and not covered by attorney-client privilege. 
There's also a misunderstanding in town that when you file a public records request, if the person you file it with doesn't have that record, they have an obligation to forward it to the person who does. I've also seen inappropriate charges when some of the mass app opponents were making uh, requests for written or, or, or paper records to the town. The charges for photocopying were not consistent with the, uh, with the, the state public records law. The other thing that happens in the town is that the lowest price employees capable of fulfilling the quest requests are not always being used. In the case of emails, what has happened in the past is instead of even using town employees at all, the town is hiring outside consultants at $100 an hour, even when there are lower cost employees in the town who can, who can obtain those records. That's not consistent with the law. Now, I think at this point, that's understood. However, while the law, the expectation of the law, and indeed the regulations of the Secretary of the Commonwealth require that the lowest paid employees be used who can obtain the records, what the town is now doing is using the highest paid employees in the IT department to provide and respond to requests for emails. So, and that brings me to the next, um, the next uh, result, which is that the town really ought to be using lower cost employees for doing anything. And, and not simply relying on the fact that they're going to be charging back the cost of records to the person making the request. Um, certainly, when you, you don't expect the head of the library to be helping you find a book. You expect the page or a low-priced or low-cost employee to do that. The question really is, are we going to take a gatekeeper approach to public records, or are we going to take a customer service approach? Now, the next resolve is that the town publish a, its schedule of fees. And this is a direct result of my experience um, last October. Originally in the warrant article, I talked about actually establishing a, uh, a, a, a set fee for emails that were furnished in response to public records request. The original cost estimate I received was a cost of between $1,000 and $1,500 to, uh, to fulfill this request, and that was the reason I appealed it. Now, I still have not yet received that request but I have heard about the number of records that, were, uh, that came out of it. And I should tell you, the reason I made this request it had to do with a property on Dudley Street that in 2009 was scheduled to come before the, the Redevelopment Board for an Environmental Design Review Special Permit. Well, 2010 comes around, and now that very same development is scheduled to go before the Zoning Board of Appeals. And I wanted to find out what happened and why the people behind me decided that they didn't have to comply with your zoning bylaw. So I, f I, filed the, um, I filed this public records request for all the emails that, one, related to 39 Dudley Street, and two, contained four names. And two of those names were the past and present owner of that property, and two of those names were for local attorneys who commonly have business uh, before the ZBA and uh, before the zoning <coughs> enforcement officer. And one of those um, people I believed or had come to understand had actually helped the zoning enforcement officer write a letter to the redevelopment board explaining why this project now was not, didn't have to go before the redevelopment board. Well, anyway, uh, the upshot of all this is that there were approximately 200 hits for emails that were uh, relevant to the property address but there were 4,000 emails related to the names of these people. And, and the, my immediate reaction was, you know, first, my God, what have I done? How did I come up with that many emails? But also, if you looked at the formula that, I, that is in the warrant article, the, the total cost that could be charged back to me for, that, uh, for those emails was uh, over $850, when in fact the revised price that came back uh, after I appealed, the, the uh, amount was $200. So in fact, the, the amount of the uh, formula is really too high. So um, I think it's important instead just to have that information published so people know what the schedule of fees is. We publish fees for everything else in town. I don't see a reason why we can't publish them for the amount that the town is charging to respond to public record request. And finally, the last result is to actually keep records on what the requests are and what the amount is that the town is charging for them. And in fact, this is something that's already required under state law. The requests themselves 
are public records, and so are the cost estimates. And the state has a whole bunch of regulations about record retention policies. But this will, I think, eliminate the problem that I see of some people not being charged anything for public records. And uh, one individual, uh, Mr. Sprague, cited the example that when he requested a bunch of emails for the Boris Coughlin affair, he was charged nothing. They were given to him promptly at no charge. Nothing like the thousand to fifteen hundred dollars that I was charged. And I think if, if everyone knows exactly how much our people are being charged for their particular requests, it would really indicate whether the town is making those charges appropriately. So I'd like to come back to where I started, and that is that I believe the town needs a better understanding of the public records law and how to, how to respond to it. And that record, the record custodians, those are the, peoples to whom, the people to whom the requests are made, should not be thought of as gatekeepers. And they, sh they should be people who respond to the request as quickly and economically as possible. And the town really needs to comply with not only the letter of the law, but also the spirit of the law, not waiting to the 10th day, the maximum amount of time allowed before they respond, not using the most expensive people they can to respond to requests. So for all of these reasons, I ask you to support this substitute motion for this resolution to send this message to town officials. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Loretti. Oh. Mr. Tully? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Joe Tully, Precinct 14. Um, when I was a kid, I used to like watching the Olympics, and I always thought it was really neat to watch everybody set records left and right, and I said, wouldn't it be great if someday you could hold a world record? I thought that was just about the best thing ever. And I was fortunate to, uh, I think, be a fair enough athlete that I had a chance to play a little bit of college athletics, but I never really certainly excelled to the point where I was going to be a world record holder or anything. But a couple of years back, I, I actually was uh, presented with the opportunity to submit a public records request to the town of Arlington, to the, the school committee and the superintendent, and I like to think that I'm sort of a record holder of sorts. Um, Mr. Loretti, I, I don't know where he is in the hall, I would have enjoyed getting a bill for $850. I was asked to pay $194,000 for records. And uh, the only reason I don't have the, the letter with me is that we're having some renovations done on the house and I can't get at the file cabinet right now. Uh, so in lieu of having to take out a second mortgage on my house, I had to settle for much less than I originally sought. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that public records requests are being treated um, in a political manner rather than in the uh, forthright manner that I think the Secretary of State's office would like them to be treated. Um, I, I would submit that my experience in addition to Mr. Loretti's probably um, speaks to that. Um, also, I, it, a, a bit of a lesser matter, but I've never really tended to get the records within the 10-day period that I've requested them. I, I did make a records request recently and and Mr. Good, in fact, was, was nice enough to get them to me in a timely manner, but some of the other requests I've made have, uh, the, the town's been rather dilatory in, in relaying those to me. Uh, I also tend to get replies from the uh, attorneys representing the, the school committee in the school district, which is odd to me because, you know, frankly, whether somebody wants their attorneys to review something or not review it, it doesn't make the record any less of a public record. And I think Mr. Loretti spoke to that, so I would, uh, I'm not going to belabor that point. Um, and one final point, I, I didn't want to really reference the ongoing litigation with the, the Odyssey people because I think a lot of us are really, frankly, tired of it. But uh, not only do I understand that, you know, some of the individuals that uh, prominently splayed emails across, uh, you know, various media, uh, were not charged for the records. I understand that uh, our former superintendent, in fact, testified that I was the only person that was charged for asking for public records related to that matter. So, you know, it is what it is. I'm a big boy. I've staked out some positions on this matter. I'm certainly willing to, to take my, my beating if people want to, uh, you know, try to take their opportunity to stick it to me when I request public records, but I think we ought to at least as a town understand that this is what's going on. Uh, it seems like it's a little dirty secret 
and it would be nice if we at least got it out in the open and had an open debate about how these record requests are being treated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tully. Um, Mr. Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Andrew Fisher, Precinct 6. Uh, I support the resolution. Uh, in my case, I wrote to the town manager's office and asked for information about, of all things, uh, the town's liability and property insurance, uh, which is through the Mass Municipal Association. And I explained I, part of what was on my mind is I wanted to know if we get a price break for having an animal control officer. <laughs> Since in normal homeowner insurance, uh, believe it or not, dog bites is about 20% of your cost. It used to be 33%. And I explained that I wondered what prevention so for uh, programs they had. Uh, and some of you know I'm interested in insurance. And the response back was it would cost me $32 an hour to get this information. Uh, and if I had known the language better, I probably could have just asked for, uh, I forget what the, there's a term for the contract. But I, I believe that they, the office could have answered my request by just handing me whatever the insurance program is. Um, so I wrote back and I explained more that this was just an ongoing interest of mine and I think it probably could be taken care of by a conversation. And uh, indeed, two or three weeks later, I got a phone call from um, a woman at, at the insurance uh, operation from Mass Municipal Association. Um, so in the end, I had about a 20 minute conversation with her and I think I found out what I wanted to know. But um, my concern is that people be treated equally around these things. Uh, maybe I'm a naughty boy, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, on another occasion, I wrote to the uh, CFO of the schools because I wanted information about special ed. And here again, I was told this could violate privacy and it would cost $32 an hour. I don't know where the $32 came from, but it was the same number. Um, in this case, uh, I said, what should I do? I said to my wife, she said, well, talk to the superintendent. So I did, and this whole, and in the meantime, I had found there was already an incredible report compiled on all those costs. So anyway, I think this is a real issue, and I, I think it ought to be dealt with uh, more forthrightly and openly, because I don't know why one person gets the $32 an hour charge and another person does not. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Maher. I'm, I'm just curious if the selectmen have uh, a position on the resolution. We'll find out in about one or two people. <laughs> Mr. Sullivan, you're next. Uh, yes, I just want to assure the uh, town meeting members that we do take uh, the public records law very seriously. And I've been at town meeting now for some eight years, and I must say that I've never seen such mischaracterization of what's going on in these public information requests as I've heard tonight. Uh, the total falsehoods that have been put out here. In terms of Mr. Loretti, he's made a number of requests for information uh, put to us. Uh, we've complied with all those requests. He's filed a number of appeals with the state. If anyone knows how the state secretary's office works on this, they take those requests very seriously. They've reviewed those appeals uh, and they've denied all those appeals. They found that the town has complied with all the requests appropriately. Uh, and again, we do take them seriously. Uh, in terms of some of the requests that may have appeared um, out of line, in terms of the cost of it, 
It may have been a case where they've asked for a substantial number of emails from a database that we really can't search, or old database records that were put away. And um, it would be very expensive now to go through that on a manual basis. But in terms of more recent records that are updated and are searchable, those are much more readily available and they cost less. As uh, Mr. Fisher just mentioned, uh, that was not a public records request. He was looking for information and uh, an analysis of what would happen to the impacts and so forth. It wasn't asking for a document. So that's not a public records request that we denied him or we're going to charge him $36 for. And that's why we referred him to the insurance company to look for the answers that he was looking for, not the document, but to speak to someone. Uh, so, you know, from our perspective here, I think this is really just getting to a point trying to insult town officials here. And I can assure you again that we've taken all these requests seriously and always will. Ms. LaCourt. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15. The Board of Selectmen has not voted on the resolution, so there is no statement from the Board of Selectmen on supporting or denying this resolution. We did vote on the original um, request. I think our biggest concern on the original request was that the proposed fee schedule was very restrictive. Um, the the persons who were needed to do the search for the particular request that Mr. Loretti made that, that made him very frustrated about the cost, um, we did need an IT professional to do those searches. And that's not, um, you know, an intern in an office who has that technical capability and training and cross-training people to do these kinds of searches is not necessarily something you can do for the lowest paid employee. It depends on the nature of the records that you're looking for and those search terms and so on and so forth. Obviously, this is all getting easier every day, technologically, and um, I do believe we solved the problem technologically eventually and were able to give Mr. Loretti what he was looking for. Um, I do have a personal opinion about this particular resolution. I think that um, one of the things that this whole discussion has brought to my attention as a selectman that I've raised with the town manager is that we do need to have consistent policies and procedures about how we handle records requests and that that information needs to be disseminated to all of our town employees. Okay. But I don't think that there's any evil intent here to obfuscate when these kind of requests come to busy town employees who have to take time away from the job that they're already hired to do, that they're already under-resourced to do, in order to attempt to comply with the request, some of which can be very broad and some of which can be very unclear. Um, so um, personally, I, you should do whatever you feel is correct about this resolution. Okay, but I hope that you will not do this in the spirit of feeling like somehow you need to do this to punish town employees who are being recalcitrant because believe me, at least on the town side, that isn't what's happening. Okay, I, I have every confidence that our employees are doing the best that they can to both comply with the law and also to provide good customer service. Um, personally, I don't know when these kind of requests come in, so I don't have the ability to do anything political to prevent um, response from happening because they go to the department heads or to the person who is concerned to fulfill the request and they don't come to the Board of Selectmen for consideration. We don't get asked by our staff whether or not it's okay to release the records or whatever. Um, our expectation is that staff will always comply with um, public records law and will always communicate with the citizens in um, the most forthright and um, uh, customer service friendly way possible and with the greatest alacrity. That's our job as selectmen to make sure that that's happening from the head on down. So that's where I'm standing. Thank you. We have a motion to adjourn. Uh, before I take the motion, any notices of reconsideration of the articles that were voted this evening? Mr. Tosti served notice on Articles 51, 61. Any others? Seeing none, Mr. Tosti has one quick announcement before we vote to adjourn. Uh, yes, uh, I just wanted to remind everybody that on Monday we'll be bringing up the capital budget.
and then the two schools, the Stratton and especially the Thompson School on Monday. So uh, I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware that those issues would be coming up on Monday. Thank you. All in favor of adjournment, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? So adjourned.